<laughs> Sorry. Good evening. This Thursday, April 26, 2018, regular meeting of the School of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and the performance of the national anthem by the Frost Middle School Chamber Orchestra under the direction of Michelle Milligan. This way, this way. For the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you, that was beautifully done, students. We are very grateful for uh, your musical talents and for entertaining our audience while you are waiting for us. I wanna thank the families who have brought your children here this evening to share their wonderful music with us. So again, thank you very much, Frost Middle Schools. Do we have a principal? Do we have the Frost principal this evening? Okay. <laughs> He's great, too. In order to comply with Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the Board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on April 12, 2018, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Is there a motion? Moved by Ms. Palchuk, seconded by Mr. Moon. All those in favor? That vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. Oh, and with uh, uh, Ms. McLaughlin away from the table. Thank you. And Ms. Schultz. Okay. I'm sorry. And ab abstention from Ms. Schultz. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, the board was not able to hold our forum, but we hope to do that again at the next meeting. A few announcements before we begin. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information is on the table by the audience auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to school board on the FCPS homepage and selecting board docs under upcoming school board meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select school board from the full menu, then click on the watch line button on the school board meetings website. Please turn off or silence your cell phone. I will now call on Ms. Vetaconda. Thank you, Madam Chair. May 7th through 11th is Teacher Appreciation Week. Teachers are real life superheroes. They educate, innovate, encourage, support, and support, touching the lives of millions of children. Every day, over 15,000 teachers in Fairfax County Public Schools demonstrate their personal and professional dedication to providing an excellent education for the children in our community. Our teachers are committed to ensuring that all children develop their full potential for academic achievement. Teachers are influential in fostering in their students both health, healthful self-concepts and a sense of civic responsibility. Fairfax County Public Schools values the skills, creativity, and professionalism that characterizes our teachers. May 2018 is also Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month. Americans of Asian and Pacific ancestry have made significant contributions to the history and development of the United States in many fields of endeavor such as science, commerce, the arts, and the humanities. The Fairfax County School Board recognizes that an understanding of these contributions should be an integral part of the year-round education of all students. Since 1992, the President of the United States has proclaimed May to be Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month and has chosen this month to pay tribute to the generations of Asian and Pacific Islanders who have enriched America's history and are instrumental in its future success. May 9th is also School Nurse Day. School Nurse Day was established in 1972 to foster a better understanding of the role of school nurses in, in an educational setting. This annual event recognizes the contributions that school nurses make every day to improve the health and success of our nation's children. This year's theme, School Nurses, Better Health, Better Learning, reflects the significant roles that uh, school nurses have in healthcare in their school communities, as well as in modeling health and resiliency. School nursing is a specialized practice of professional nursing that advances the health and well-being of students and is an integral part of a quality school health system. School nurses promote health, safety, prevention, and wellness, intervene with actual and potential health problems, and provide case management services. They are an invaluable bridge connecting health care providers, public health, and families. The school system works closely with the Fairfax County Health Department to provide quality services to the children of Fairfax County Public Schools and recognize May 9th as School Nurse Day in Fairfax County. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will call on Ms. Evans for a resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm very pleased to offer this resolution uh, um, in honor of the Columbia Elementary School 50th anniversary. And uh, we had a a uh, tremendous uh, celebration uh, with the Columbia school community. So I will now read the resolution. Whereas Columbia Elementary School in Annandale, Virginia will proudly celebrate its 50th anniversary on March 23, 2018 and its reputation for providing generations of students from a richly diverse community with an excellent academic foundation. And whereas Columbia is a high-performing elementary school dedicated to providing a strong instructional program in an inviting school environment for its students who represent over 26 countries and speak 36 different languages and has enriched students through its local level four advanced academic program. Foreign language and elementary schools, ESOL, special education, advanced academics, preschool autism program along with young scholars, mentor works, and partners in print programs. And whereas, the school has continued to provide the best educational tools and learning opportunities for its students by embracing new initiatives, implementing best practices in instruction, equipping classrooms with the latest educational technology, integrated smart boards, and implementation of responsive classroom school-wide, and whereas the faculty, parents, and community of Columbia are committed to increasing the emotional well-being and academic achievement of all students, 
while viewing its diversity as a unique opportunity and strength that enriches and broadens the educational experiences of, of all students and prepares them for the workforce via the tenets of Portrait of a Graduate. And whereas thousands of students have passed through the doors at Columbia Elementary School and benefited from a comprehensive education and the efforts of dedicated and caring teachers and staff, whose vision it is that all students learn and become literate, self-motivated, well-rounded, independent learners who demonstrate responsibility to self and society. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board honors Columbia Elementary School on the occasion of its 50th anniversary, commends the school on its history of providing educational excellence and enrichment opportunities to the students and community. I so move. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Palchuk. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous with Ms. Schultz away from the table. And I would like to invite uh, Principal Mike Cunningham and Assistant Principal Rekha uh, Patel to join us uh, at the dais for a photograph with the school board. Please come on up. Next, I will call on Ms. Darren Koufax, Recogni Recognition of Better Hearing and Speech Month. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I am honored to be offering this recognition in, uh, for Better Hearing and Speech Month. Since 1927, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, ASHA, has celebrated Better Hearing and Spe Speech Month every year in May. The theme this year is Communication for All. The annual event provides opportunities to promote services that can improve the quality of life for those who experience problems with speaking and listening. An estimated 42 million people have communication disorders and they impact one in 10 families. Currently, Fairfax County Public Schools provides speech and language services to more than 10,000 students. Audiologists and speech education teachers also serve more than 500 deaf and hard of hearing students in class-based programs via base school itinerant services and in early childhood programs. FCPS annually observes and celebrates Better Hearing and Speech Month and encourages all citizens in our community to recognize the efforts, dedication, and skills of the speech language clinicians, audiologists, and teachers of students who are deaf and hard of hearing. I now invite staff from the Office of Vision and Hearing Services to join me for a picture with our board.
It was like a Next, I will call on Mr. McElveen for recognition of School Nutrition Employee Week. Thank you, Madam Chair. May 7th through 11th is School Nutrition Employee Week. Caring, trained, thoughtful, professional, dedicated, these are just a few words that describe today's school nutrition professional. School nutrition employees in Fairfax County Public Schools demonstrate daily their professional commitment to providing students with nutritious menu choices that reflect current research and meet the dietary guidelines for Americans. School nutrition employees must balance many roles and follow numerous federal, state, and local regulations to ensure safe and healthy meals are available in schools. They are trained sanitation and food safety experts and must manage financially self-sufficient programs. School nutrition professionals also provide nutrition education to students as well as healthy catering services to their communities. They use their creativity to make the cafeteria a fun and welcoming place all year long and perform their jobs each day because they care passionately about the children they serve. FCPS school nutrition employees are committed to imparting food and nutrition knowledge and skills to students using the school cafeteria as a nutrition laboratory and they are influential in preparing students to learn. I would like to invite staff from the Food and Nutrition Services Department to join me at the dais for a picture with the board. Next, I will call on Ms. McLaughlin for Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. Ms. McLaughlin. Children's Mental Health Awareness Day is May 10th, 2018. The well-being of children has a profound, immediate, and lasting impact on our community. Nationally, over one in five children and youth have a mental health issue. 
and only half of children and youth with behavioral health issues receive treatment. Fairfax County Public Schools is a partner with county agencies and nonprofit organizations in the Healthy Minds Fairfax Initiative to address barriers to accessing services by coordinating prevention, early intervention, and treatment services. The school board is pleased to recognize May 10th as Children's Mental Health Awareness Day in Fairfax County, where we recognize that mental health in childhood means reaching developmental and emotional milestones, learning healthy social skills, effectively coping with problems, and that together as a community, we support all our youth in reaching their emotional, psychological, and social well-being. I would like to invite our staff from our Department of Special Services, as well as our community and county partners to join me at the dais along with my colleagues for a picture at the, with the board. And now I will call on Ms. Evans for a resolution renaming the Annandale High School Equipment Room. Ms. Evans. Well, it is my great pleasure to offer the resolution naming the Equipment Room at Annandale High School, Coach William Everett Cloud Equipment Room. Whereas William Everett Cloud, son of a Fairfax County Public Schools educator, attended Fairfax County Schools where he was a standout multi-sport student athlete at both Falls Church High School and McLean High School, graduating from McLean in 1957. And whereas Coach Cloud had a remarkable collegiate football career at the University of Maryland and returned upon graduation to teach and coach at George C. Marshall High School from 1962 to 1973 and at Annandale High School from 1973 until his retirement in 1988. And whereas Coach Cloud instructed, coached, and mentored students as a teacher and a varsity football and softball coach during his tenure at Annandale High School and provided guidance and counsel to students who sought his advice, which reflected the value of teamwork, integrity, and mutual respect. And whereas Coach Cloud worked tirelessly and joyfully to perform the behind-the-scenes work required to support student-athletes and the Annandale High School community, including athletic field maintenance, distribution of athletic equipment, and preparation of field and facilities to ensure the safety and enjoyment of student athletes. And whereas Coach Cloud served as a role model both in the classroom and on the field, demonstrating an unparalleled work ethic, integrity, respect for others, and a sincere interest in every student and player. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board names the athletic equipment room at Annandale High School 
the Coach William Everett Cloud Equipment Room in honor of this exemplary educator, coach, colleague, father, friend, citizen, and mentor. I so move. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. McLaughlin. All those in favor? That motion passes unanimously with Mrs. Schultz and Mr. Wilson away from the table. And I would like to invite and welcome Rachel Cloud Watts and her children, Jake and Emma, as well as uh, Annandale Principal Tim Thomas to uh, please join us for a photograph at the dais. I believe that some of my colleagues would like to speak to this motion. Ms. Evans. I'll just speak very briefly. You know, I was very pleased to um, be able to work with uh, Coach Cloud's family, uh, with his daughter and, uh, and grandchildren uh, to, to move this forward. You know, uh, Coach Cloud, from all um, the, the many um, uh, letters that we got, the support from the community, from the principal, from uh, Bill Curran, uh, to talk about, you know, what a wonderful man he was. So I think uh, the resolution does say a lot of it. It talks about his history. And so it's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to honor somebody like this on a permanent basis at, at, at one of our schools. And um, particularly, um, you know, at Annandale, where he, he, uh, he was there for so long and made such an impact on so many people's lives and so many students. So thank you. Um, to him and to his family, um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. So thank you for being here. And Ms. Corbett Sanders wished to speak. Uh, I, Ms. Oh. Ms. Strauss, I'm sorry. I seconded the motion sure. and had asked to be able to speak. I'm sorry, that's fine. I didn't see your light. So uh, I just wanted to share with the Cloud family. So I feel uh, uh, just a, a special um, heartwarming um, connection to this because my husband played Woodson High School football uh, while your dad was the head coach at Annandale. And one of our very close family friends played on the rival Annandale team, George Fruchterman. So I'm sure, okay, yay. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yes. And so, um, you know, and, and George is still a very dear friend um, and our children have grown up together. And watching him have to walk onto the Woodson field for his daughter's homecoming, 
yeah, Queen, uh, he was like, I, I'm not supposed to be here as a Woodson. I'm all Ad Annandale Adams. And so just to see your father, and I understand he's watching. So to Coach Cloud, just want to say um, thank you for your tremendous years of service, for not only bringing um, such spirited rivalry uh, between Annandale and Woodson all those years ago, but for shaping um, the young men and the women who were blessed to have you at, at that time at Annandale High School school. Um, I'm also the mother of two football, high school football players, and I know how much the coaches have shaped their lives and the gift your father gave to all those players and to Annandale High School. We are forever indebted to that, and so I'm so thrilled that we can honor Coach Cloud in this very special way, and uh, to his grandkids sitting in the audience, um, you should be so proud of your grandfather. What a very special man, and uh, is so deserving of the recognition here tonight. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you. Um, we name parts of our buildings and our buildings about uh, after people that are inspirational and that can evoke a. Um, a connection with our students so that our students um, want to model them or to live up to um, certain characteristics that these people have. And your dad is that type of leader. I was blessed in the 70s to be jealous of the Annandale Adams. Um, it was the team to beat. Uh, and I had three, bro three cousins that played for your dad. And they, to this day, talk about the important role that he had in shaping the lives of his team members into ethical, um, community-minded leaders. And um, so thank your dad for all he has done for our students and thank him for sharing his name um, with the community going forward. And again, congratulations and thank you for your family service. Thanks. And for lending your dad to all of us. The next order of business is citizen participation. Tonight, 10 citizens have signed up to address the board, and we also have one video testimony. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Please be mindful that there are often young children in attendance at these meetings or watching at home. So language should be appropriate for all age levels. Thank you for your cooperation and thanks to those who have come out to speak to us tonight. Our first speaker is Maxina Sheff. Um, my name is Maxina Sheft, and I'm a student attending Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, and I am currently conducting research on chronic absenteeism within our school community. Tonight's agenda includes a motion to approve Goal 1, student success. Ongoing debates and research available today point to numerous ways that we can help students succeed, but I think we can all agree on one thing, that students learn more when they spend more time in school, and motivating students to attend school should be a primary goal of any educational institution. And you might be wondering, why should we worry about chronic absenteeism? Attendance in Fairfax County is overall very good, with an attendance rate of 95.68% uh, last school year. However, traditional attendance metrics can be misleading and can conceal chronically absent students. For example, Baltimore City Public Schools recently had an average attendance rate of 93%, but a chronic absenteeism rate of nearly 20%. And chronic absenteeism is more than just skipping class a few times a year. Researchers define chronic absenteeism as missing 10% or more of instructional time, which means in Fairfax County, missing 18 or more school days per year, which averages out to two days per month. 
And the Fairfax County Youth Survey of 2015 revealed that 3.2% of about 33,000 students who responded had skipped three or more days during that month alone. And that's without counting those who are chronically absent even though their absences are excused, such as those missing for medical related problems. My primary goal in speaking here tonight is to raise awareness about chronic absenteeism. Taking action to reduce the numbers of those who are chronically absent will make a big difference to their success and the success of FCPS students as a whole. Fairfax County already has some programs in place, such as Return to Learn, which helps students integrate back into school following an extended absence. There are also plenty of resources available online for school officials and parents who want to learn more about this issue. Now, parents are more involved in day-to-day -day attendance than they have ever been with their ability to check their child's SIS or student information system account, which tracks attendance. But more can always be done. According to the U.S. Department of Education, a chronically absent student between 8th and 12th grade is seven times more likely to drop out of school. Kindergarten or chronic absenteeism is directly linked to lower reading levels, and even just a small percentage of chronically absent students can mean thousands of students across Fairfax County who aren't receiving access to essential instructional time in classrooms. I hope I've uh, made you think about this issue within our community today, and I hope that through the implementation of new programs or the improvement of currently existing programs in FCPS, we can reduce chronic absenteeism. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We always appreciate it when students come and share their comments with us. Thank you very much, Michelle. Our next speaker is Monique Baruti. I tried to resume my life, but thoughts of that take kept haunting me. The sounds of the suction, the coldness of the room, the other girls moaning. I became depressed and alcohol and drugs became my friend. I still have things that make me grieve, like when I go to the dentist and the suction machine goes on. Society says abortion will take care of that problem, but no one told me that my life would never be the same, ever. After my abortions, I felt unbearable grief and sorrow. I became angry and depressed. I became more promiscuous, partied more, drank more alcohol, trying to numb the pain and push the darkness away. My life was a mess. I killed my baby when I was 19 years old. I can wrap that in terms that society would seem acceptable, such as it was my body, my choice, or it was just a clump of cells. But when I walked out of that clinic, I knew I had killed my baby and a part of myself died that day as well. When I had the abortion, my life was never the same again. I began to punish myself and became anorexic. At the clinic, the staff did not provide counsel about options or complications. I vividly remember the sound and intensity of the vacuum. They took my money, my baby, and my self-respect. I felt lonely and so guilty, worthless. My drug and alcohol use increased dramatically. I sought love and approval the only way I knew how, with sex. All I ever wanted was to be a wife and a mother someday, but now who could possibly want me? Do these words sound like they come from young girls who are emotionally healthy and are ready to come to school and spend a rigorous day learning? I've repeatedly heard this school system tout the work that it does to promote the emotional and social health of FCPS students and the impact it has on student success. At the last Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee meeting, I heard representatives suggesting that we should not include information on the physical, emotional, and psychological risks of abortion in our FLE curriculum. In fact, it was stated by the FCCPTA representative that discussing the risks of abortion might shame a student who's had one. And Mrs. Palchik's representative stated that abortion is one of the safest procedures you can get and that the psychological risks just come from a society that doesn't support abortion. If you provide people the right kind of support, the psychological risks apparently just go away. Data shows otherwise. And the thousands of women who are part of the Silent No More campaign will tell you otherwise as well. I got these stories from Silent No More. Girls deserve better than abortion, and our girls in FCPS certainly deserve factual information about the physical, emotional, and psychological risks of abortion so they can make informed decisions, come to school ready to learn, and be a part of the student success story here in FCPS. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Robert Rigby.
Good evening, school board members, Dr. Brabrand, and senior staff. My name is Robert Rigby, Jr. I've been teaching in FCPS for more than 19 years and am the current president of FCPS Pride, a social welfare organization for LGBTQ employees founded in 2015. We were quickly joined by parents of LGBTQ students and LGBTQ parents and grandparents and many allies. I want to speak about the SRNR. The piece about which I'm most excited to see is the addition of the parent and student ombudsman, whose mission will be to assist parents and students in working on concerns of discrimination. This is terrific. Several times each year, people come to me with such concerns, and often I'm at a loss of to whom to send them for help. The ombudsman will be a central person who will help parents and students address such issues within the system. That effort will succeed, I think, in making FC FCPS a friendlier and more welcoming place for all students. The effect will spread and create an atmosphere in which each person feels more welcome. I urge you to retain that addition. I think of the history of the anti-harassment provision in the SRNR that is inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity. I remember when the board added sexual orientation in the spring of 2001 after many alarming meetings, email campaigns, and rallies in opposition. Last year, it survived a lawsuit. It is an important provision, but I wonder about the degree to which it is taught to our children and used. I know that now on the SRNR quiz, there is a question about sexual orientation, which is a good thing. There is no question on gender identity. In the video at the beginning of the year that talks about sexual harassment, gender identity is mentioned. Unfortunately, it is defined incorrectly immediately afterwards. The video conflates gender identity with gender expression. It's confusing, misleading, and ineffective. Um, we can do better. Nevertheless, FCPS is moving in the right direction. Many thanks to the school board, Dr. Brabrand, and senior staff for the progress that has been made. The last few years have been difficult for LGBTQ people, but also Muslim uh, students and African American students and immigrant students. What can we do? I say we can teach. The Cultural Proficiency Department is doing a tremendous job in educating staff, and I understand that the Chief Academic and Equity Officer has proposed more personnel dedicated to equity, both countywide and in schools. Such work will go a long ways to count conf huh? countering the unfriendly currents. Please approve his proposals. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fred Costello. You know my name, I guess. Um, there's a man who thought he was a bird. He covered himself with feathers, attached eagle wings to his arms, and then went to the roof of a 10-story building to demonstrate flying from building to building. His friends tried to stop him. You're not a man. You're, you are a man, not a bird. He responded, I know for certain that I am a bird, even though I have the DNA of a man. His mind was in error. His mind did not agree with physical reality. He was insane. After speaking here in March about Lupron-induced dementia in male to female transgenders, I was found out um, to the vestibule by such, just such a person, plus a host of his supporters, including teachers and students. The person did not think he was a bird, but he did think he was a woman. He argued like the bird man, I know for certain that I am a woman, even though the DNA, I have the DNA of a man. His mind is in error. His mind does not agree with physical reality. He didn't die by flying from a 10-story building, but he might die from dementia. The British National Health Service now warns about the long-term effects of transgender drugs as a program for dealing with transgender dementia. I'm a retired rocket scientist. We scientists rely on the reality of the physical world, what's outside our minds, not what is in each person's mind. Our minds extend our knowledge beyond the physical world, but never contradict it. <clears throat> I am shocked that you reject science in favor of accommodating girl men, not bird men, but girl men. Transgenders need bona fide psychological help for them to understand the location of reality. 
near accommodating them is blocking the help they really need. Don't be bullied by the threats of suicide. Almost every religion cites the dire consequences of suicide, but your secular psychologists argue unconvincingly that suicide is simply not a nice thing to do. Then they surrender to the transgender's bullying. Don't surrender also. Practice what you teach. Okay? You teach in science class that reality is in the physical world, but you practice in your policies that reality is in the minds of people, each person, such as transgenders, having his own reality. Be for all students a good example. Don't produce confused STEM students. Be for all transgenders a true help. Don't produce mentally mutilated students. Thank you. The next speaker is Andy Bayer. Good evening to the FCPS board and to members of the audience. My name is Andrea Bayer, and I currently have a ninth grader at Oakton High School, and I have two older daughters, both who graduated from Oakton, in two, one in 2012 and one in 15. As we all know, liberal activists have been haranguing this board over the past several months, begging you for, to issue policy to accommodate our transgendered students, regardless of the fact that such students are a very minute minority within FCPS. And in my opinion, these transgendered students are being erroneously exploited for two reasons. First, to further a progressive ideological agenda, and secondly, to generate monetary profits. And regarding the latter, I'm referring specifically to Big Pharma, the myriads of doctors, and the so-called family health specialists, some of which serve on our FLECAC committee, educators, the teachers' unions, and the like all who profit extensively from this relatively new market of gender dysphoria. But sadly, it is the students, and by this I mean every student, who are hurt in the process simply by a loss of their personal dignity and their right to bodily privacy. But greed is a nasty addiction, and such greed feeds the FCPS pride activists. In a recent post on social media, FCPS pride activists identified several pro-family policy groups who are, they say, against um, this exploitation and greed. And, state, and they say their stated combined estimated budget of these pro-family groups is 24 million. Sounds like a lot. And this money is somehow seen as a threat to their advocacy. So what is their advocacy? According to their Facebook post, which um, th these transgender proponents want our students to be told about and sold on the drug called PrEP. That's a capital P, a little r, a capital E, and a capital P. It stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, which is marketed as an antiviral drug and sold under the name of Truvada. And this is owned by the pharmaceutical giant Gilead, G-I-L-E-A-D. And this drug was approved in 2012 by the FDA. And to enhance their ideology and sales, it is desired that PrEP be included in the FLE curriculum and presented as an option that would allow students who engage in high-risk behavior, and I think we know what that means, um, to be free to do so without any repercussions. To this end, PrEP is being explained to our students as something that will save lives. Is that three minutes? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Valerie Wu. Good evening. My name is Valerie Wu, and I'm the parent of a Rolling Valley student who is part of the Split Feed cohort. I know what you're thinking, yes, another one. And yes, I'm here to ask you to end the Split Feed situation at Rolling Valley. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand. I have nothing against Key Middle School and Lee High School. I myself was a member of the Split Feed cohort out of Rolling Valley, and I received a fine education from Key and Lee. But this Split Feed makes no sense. First, I want to touch on the buses. Three buses are sent from Lee District into Springfield District to pick, our, 
pick up our children and transport them to Key Middle School. Two of them pick up only members from the Rolling Valley Split Feed cohort. One of these buses picks up students from four neighborhoods. One of them is Daventry Park, which is a mere two miles from Irving Middle School. In fact, buses from Irving pass these neighborhoods to pick up students from Gambrel and Seidenstricker. Another of these buses picks up students from three neighborhoods, which all meet at a single bus stop. This is the only stop, bu stop on this bus route, and this year there are only 17 students eligible at this stop. Yes, Fairfax County sends an, an, a full-size school bus, which costs thousands of dollars to maintain each year, capable of seating 58 students to pick up 17 children at a single stop. Another thing I want to touch on is the fact that once our children graduate from elementary school, they are attending schools in a district we don't live in, can't vote for, and have little to no voice in. This makes it very difficult to address our concerns in any meaningful way. Lastly, I want to mention that eliminating the split feed out of Rolling Valley will impact less than 5% of the population of any of the schools involved. This means that there will be no meaningful changes to the demographics, academics, or funding of any of the schools. But it will have a huge impact on our children. Eliminating the split feed will allow our children to remain with their peers whom they have spent the previous seven years with. It will allow our children to remain with their friends at a time in their development when friends are part of their identity. I know the board wants to make sure that any changes to the school district boundaries won't negatively impact Key and Lee, but the interests of our children need to be considered too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fabiola Green. Good evening. My name is Fabiola Green. I live in Burke, and two of my children will attend FCPS in fall. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about Strategic Goal 1, Student Success specifically about how FCPS is proposing to use technology to meet this goal. I'm not at all opposed to technology, but my family and I are very concerned about the way our school system is heading. And we're not alone. I'm honored to say I'm speaking for a large group of families worried about the dangers of increased technology use in FCPS classrooms. We all understand and value the county's desire to close the achievement gap and to increase student success. However, it isn't proven that programs like one-to-one -one will lead to success. Research from the Urban Institute examined the arrival of broadband service in North Carolina over a five-year period. The introduction of home computer technology in this research is associ associated with modest, but statistically significant negative impacts on student math and reading test scores, thus broadening math and reading achievement gaps. The National Education Association has several suggestions to close the achievement gap, none of which involve computers or technology, but rather reducing class sizes and investing in teacher development. We entrust the public schools to teach our children how to become successful in reading, writing, adapting to diverse envir environments, and to be socially functional citizens in society. This is a high task placed on public schools Giving laptops to students in all school levels is not the solution on its own. The use of the technology has to be re regulated to avoid potential side effects, which include obesity and the lack of face-to-face -face communication skills. We need compassionate teachers in smaller classes and time limits, no matter where we're from or if our parents went to college or not. To hear that schools all across the county are implementing their own technology programs without strict guidelines in all classes is troublesome. Again, we understand you're trying to prepare our children for the future, but we also want them to arrive there mentally and physically healthy. Our kids will have no problem adapting to technology as it changes so quickly. Rather, the concern should be, are we creating a whole new set of issues for our children as we isolate them into their own digital worlds. And so far, the evidence is pointing to yes. We need significantly more research before making such a drastic change in our instructional methods. We, concerned teachers and parents in FCPS, urge you to think about how to best regulate and balance traditional education and modern, fast-paced technology to help us raise functional and thriving human beings. 
Shouldn't we first focus on decreasing the classroom size as we look to close the educational achievement gap before we look to spend millions? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Laura Miller. Laura Miller. And before you start the clock, Clockmaster, can I just respond to Megan McLaughlin real quickly about AHS? My brother was best friends with George Fruchtemann. Small world. But he loved Annandale, he loved those rivals, and how dare George go to Woodson. Anyway, oh, and I had uh, brothers and sisters in the 70s on these teams that took it to, I guess, your cousin's teams, and I'm sorry. Not really, but it was fun. But that's what it should be. You can start me now, Clockmaster. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it should be. It's fun. Right? High school is fun. Well, that's, that's why I'm here, because at the moment there's an issue for student success that might not be so fun. It's, I call it the FLE problem, okay? Because there's, we've kind of pitted two sides against each other. And let's just for, you know, sake, it goes back since the beginning of the time, the prudent and the traditional versus the free love and the progressives. That's basically what it is now. Right now, the FLE is addressing one group, and I'm happy for them, and they're gonna fight for it tooth and nail to keep it that way. But you have forgotten about a whole nother group, and it's not making it fun, and it's very uncomfortable, because it counters many people's beliefs, their conscious, and what they think would be successful for their students. And that's not the way we're supposed to make everyone comfortable and fun in school. And the group, my group isn't just me, random people that you went to FCPS. It includes Muslims, Asians, Latinos, African Americans, Jews, if we must name everybody, Protestants, Evangelicals, Catholics, the sexual, sexually reserved, the self-control advocates, the pro-lifers, the feminists, the scientific fact and medically risk followers, the tomboys, the artistic man, the therapy freedom advocates, those that know kids just want to be kids and that science has proven that they can't do rational thinking until they're about 25 anyways. We don't want you to press encouragement of lifelong altering decisions on such young kids. Let them be kids. This whole group disagrees with the current FLE. So we could just keep on fighting about it. I could keep raising hell and bringing it on. Or we could say, hey, look, let's do a choice in FLE and make it all opt in with informed consent so the parents can actually read the very transparent FLE lessons and choose what is right for them. What could these choices be? I'll Propose three. One, one that simply just doesn't go beyond the Virginia state standards. Okay, then how about another one that does that but adds a supplemental progressive and newest science lessons? Or how about another one that does the state standards but adds the more prudent and traditional life sciences? Okay, to please them. And let the parents know about this through informed, very transparent. Um, consent, so that you don't get hypothetical consent, but actual real consent, and they can choose what best fits their family values. Now, we're all Americans, and we know that to battle the constant conflicts of religious beliefs is to, well, embrace the freedom of conscience. Give them choices. Give us choices. Now, right now, you might say, oh, well, just opt out, or go to private school. Those are your solutions. Those aren't good enough. We pay taxes too. Everybody takes tax, pays taxes. We need choice. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Shia Munshi. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. My name is Sean, and I would like to do a couple things in the two minutes and 55 seconds I have left. I want to first of all express my thanks for the LGBTQ inclusive environment that my kids experience in school. And second thing is I want to express the expectation of leadership and continued improvement. So my family moves a lot. Every couple of years or so we move around. We've experienced four different school districts in the time my kids have been going to school. And not all districts handle bullying well, not all districts are inclusive, and not all districts take the lead. But I can tell you my kids are safe and supported in their Fairfax County School District schools, so thanks. So I'm here to say thanks, and I want to talk about bullying and uh, incorporating inclusiveness and leadership in the next two minutes or so. So let me begin by addressing bullying. 
I know you guys know the importance of protecting our kids from bullying. I understand that your primary goal is to educate, but I also understand that you understand that you can't do that without a safe environment. <clears throat> it's also true that LGBTQ students, like all non-majority groups, are at elevated risk of bullying. As the parent of a happy and healthy transgender daughter, I'm exceptionally aware of this link and how safe my kids feel at school. As far as incorporating inclusiveness, the American College of Physicians found that ensuring the well-being of the LGBTQ population will take concerted effort from society as a whole. My kids' school is a large part of their society. This school district is a large part of our community. My daughter transitioned during the summer um, after being at her Fairfax school, Fairfax County School for two years. Same students she was with, same teacher she was with, same administration for two years. They called her by her, the correct name and the correct pronoun the very first day, and that is amazing. <clears throat> That's inclusivity. What leaves me, that leaves me with leadership. So it's easy to do. Other districts have successfully done it. The nearby District of Columbia School District did it. DCSD ensured visible allies in the form of school liaisons and out for safe school badges are present throughout their district. Boulder Valley School District in Colorado did it. BVSD's policy is to always use preferred names and pronouns, period. Los Angeles Unified School District also did it. LAUSD published policy that outlined the rights of transgender and gender nonconforming students with respect to facilities, privacy, and dress code. You've started to do it. Appointing the Fairfax County Ombudsman to ensure parents and children are heard is a great step, but there's always more. So a couple things I'd suggest. Uh, provide staff professional development opportunities with respect to inclusivity that address the unique issues that LGBT youth face. My daughter's school has been very supportive in, in using her preferred name and pronouns from the beginning. That should be true district-wide. FCPS has an amazing reputation nationwide. This is a great opportunity for your district to take the lead on this important issue that has the support of countless professional organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John DeLong. Um, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to address you this evening. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, contracting practices um, because last night the audit committee met and heard a presentation on a recent audit. Uh, I encourage you all to read the full report rather than just the executive summary. Uh, this is the first such audit that's been done since the 2015 audit that also reviewed contracting practices in FCPS. Um, I commend the Audit Committee and the Aud uh, Auditor General for undertaking this review and OPS for their recommitment to instituting appropriate controls, particularly in respect of the sole source contracts. I note that the 2015 contract audit made more extensive recommendations, including to adopt a performance-based evaluation of contracts than the 2018 contract, uh, contract audit. Some 25 outstanding recommendations from this 2015 audit of almost three years ago were summarily dismissed um, and, and closed uh, this month by the Auditor General uh, in putting this 2018 audit together. This decision is not mentioned specifically in the 2018 audit. It's not incorporated in there, and there is no discussion of what management actions were accomplished that would warrant this action. It's clear from the 2018 findings that there are still significant weaknesses that have yet to be addressed. While the OAG has proposed and management has undertaken to address some of these deficiencies, no proposal has been made to review all of the outstanding contracts to ensure appropriate authorities, basis for pricing, and perhaps most importantly, that evaluation metrics are appropriate. In the audit, the 2018 audit, some 30% of sampled contracts were found to have insufficient documentation, and all of the sampled sole source contracts lacked justification documentation. On page 14 of the 2018 audit, it notes that, quote, sole source contracts should be utilized on an exception basis. That should be on page one. It's on page one in every federal contracting authority. It's on page one in every corporate contracting authority. 
The proposed signatory review levels are a good first step to ensuring that this form of contracting is minimized and controlled. I urge the administration and board to publicly post the detailed contracts register to ensure transparency. It is clear that there has been insufficient progress in achieving robust controls on contracting following the 2015 audit. I hope that this new attention to this issue encourages more progress on this important objective of ensuring the careful stewardship of FCPS resources. Much more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Our last testimony is a video testimony to be presented by Catherine Stewart. We have screens in front of us and screens behind us. Hello everybody. Tonight you will hear a summary of the 2018 General Assembly session from the Michael Molly of FCPS Government Affairs. One of the many bills that passed was HB 1419-SB273, which gave local schools district the flexibi flexibility to offer more recess in elementary school. On behalf of more recess to Fairfax County, I am asking that you use that flexibility to give us two recesses per day that are at least 20 minutes long. Here are some of my reasons. Recess can help build muscles, thus it makes a healthy lifestyle because we run, play, and have fun. Recess can help build social skills by learning how to make new friends and play with old friends. Also, recess is a benefit for teachers. Example, the PE teachers, because we can apply physical and mental activities we've learned to recess. It helps the art teachers because we can apply skills we have learned and use them to play with chalk. It is a benefit for the music teachers because we can get together and sing. And best of all, it is a benefit for our homeroom teachers because usually after recess, the kids are tired, therefore the kids are calm, and so it is a peaceful environment, and he or she does not have to yell as much. Thank you for listening. Governor Northland signed HB 1419 and SB 273 into law, giving local school districts the flexibility to offer more recess to elementary school students. Our parents worked hard to get you that flexibility. Now to leave is us um, recess. Um, Two 20 minute recesses would be nice. What grade are you in? Second. Second grade. What yeah. do you like about recess? I like that we, we get like 10 minutes. Is that enough? 10 minutes is enough? I'd say we would like some more. You want some more? I really like the playground though. What's your favorite thing about recess? Um, that we get to play with all our friends and there's lots of equipment. Yeah. We get to play outside and we get to do whatever we want. I'm in second grade and I think there should be more recess because it makes more fun for elementary school students. What do you like about recess? Um, I get to run around and play. Yeah? Does that make your body feel good? Yes. Yeah? But it's on hot days. So what's the worst part of recess? So that we don't get enough. You don't get enough? We don't get enough play time. Do you think that the Fairfax County School Board should give you more recess? Yeah! yeah. We really enjoy hearing from our children. That's great. Thank you to the adults who helped with that. And I think, again, we would like to thank the parents who helped lobby the General Assembly that changed the Virginia Code that gives us more flexibility for recess. So we are great, very grateful for that help. And again, please tell the kids they were great. We'd like more of that. <laughs> Next, I would like to call on Ms. Fetaconda. Thank you, Madam Chair. So first, I'd like to start out by recognizing all the Boy Scouts in the audience who are working towards their citizenship in the community badge. Guys, if you could all stand up, we'd love to give you a round of applause. So I've been working with a group of students who are interested in the strategies that FCPS can use to combat chronic absenteeism. You've heard from Maxina, one of those students in tonight's citizen participation. And 
she talked about the severe impact that missing even one day a month can have on students' literacy skills and later on their ability to graduate on time. As we're looking at goal one and the upcoming SRNR, I think chronic absenteeism is one of the important, most important issues that we should be dedicating our resources to. So the students in this group have been working to identify solutions that we can implement to reduce chronic absenteeism in our school system based on research from neighboring school districts and school districts of comparable size, ranging from formal mentorship programs and collaboration with community partners to increase school monitoring of attendance problems and bringing parents into schools for, for example, how to help your kid uh, succeed at homework or how to help set them set up study areas, things like that, so that parents are more involved with children's education. I look forward to continuing my work with this group and hopefully have a forum proposal to the full board soon regarding a review of our current strategies in school so that we can eventually move forward with the set of best practices that all of our schools can adopt. And on the matter of goal one, uh, student success, I'm going to speak to two of the main desired outcomes. So the first one is that grades, uh, grading will be an accurate reflection of learning. So I've spoken about this before, but I think we, on this specific desired outcome, we need to continue surveying students on this so that in the future we're not realigning our grading standards without student feedback. And every year we're getting more data onto how our students are seeing the grading policies implemented and whether those are actually helpful or not. I think we need an annual survey for the entire county regarding our grading pol uh, policies, but many of our students have also suggested disaggregating this by schools. So that school administrations receive data about the grading and workload policies that students in their specific schools find either successful or potentially burdensome because it's kind of hard for school administrations and us to compare grading policies across schools, but within schools, students might have identified a specific problem that their administration might not know about, so having this survey would be very, very helpful. I'd also like to implement a set of best practices for grading, homework, and returning graded student work so that students are receiving timely feedback. Because if, we're, if we want students to see their grading as a reflection of their learning, then we need to make sure that they're seeing this reflection of their learning and the evaluations throughout the quarter so that they have enough time to learn from them and improve on, on future ass assessments, rather than getting to the end of three units of math and figuring out that, oh, I think I messed up something way back over there in the first unit. And on the second desired outcome, students will be fluent in two or more languages. This has been a more recent issue, actually. We want, when we want to make sure that students are committing to learning a foreign language, we need to make sure that we're offering students every opportunity to, be, to begin that study of a foreign language. So some students have approached me about some issues of level one of, a cer of certain foreign languages being discontinued at a high school because it seemed that level one of those languages was being offered at all the feeder middle schools. However, this would prevent students from being able to start a new language in high school that they can truly be engaged with. And it would also prevent students from being able to seek remediation in level one before progressing to level two which I think we can all agree is a foundation for a successful language experience. I've been working with our student advocates and student government at this high school, and while we have achieved a temporary solution to this for the 2018-2019 school year, I think it's important that we make sure that all schools have the staffing and the funding available to offer level one of all possible languages. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fenaconda. Next is uh, the strategic plan goal one, student success, and I call on Mr. Moon for a motion. Ah, okay. I wasn't sure if Mr. Malloy had arrived because I know you were on your way from Richmond. So you are here. <laughs> I was waiting for the high sign. An update on the Virginia General Assembly. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I have to admit, I've never had such a great introduction as I got during uh, public comment today. I was pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Um, as uh, as uh, Chairman Strauss mentioned, I'm here to present to you the uh, summary of what happened during the 2018 Virginia General Assembly. Um, I say a summary of what happened. They're actually still going in some cases, but in terms of the policy work, they've completed all of their uh, their activity for the year. So I wanted to walk you through some of the things that that passed, some of uh, and some of the things that happened during the session. Let's see if I can get this right. Excellent. So this year is a, a 60 day long session. They call it the long session. It, uh, it's the session in which they're supposed to take care of the uh, biennial budget. 
Um, during this session, the General Assembly considered over 2,500 pieces of legislation during that 60-day period. Um, of those 2,500, about 850 were actually approved, and another 200 of them were uh, what they call in, in the General Assembly continued to 2019. Essentially, that's legislation that doesn't go forward this year, but is set aside so that they can look at it a little bit more in the off session, possibly to bring it back in 2019. Um, during this session, uh, in, in terms of, of the 2,500 bills, uh, we looked through all of them and about 500 of them at one point were routed to staff and, and, uh, and included on our website as having some possible interest to FCPS or some possible impact. Obviously not all 500 of them went forward and not all 500 of them did have an impact, but um, it gives you an idea of the, the spread of, of legislation that deals with uh, the school's issues. All right, and on cue, the very first thing that I have to bring up, um, and just to let you know, the first section of this report, um, these are all pieces of legislation that directly relate back or directly stem from positions of this board. Um, so I tried to identify where the board position came from, but you'll recognize them because they're all uh, related to board positions that uh, you've taken. Uh, the first bill you've, you've already gotten a, a, an introduction to, uh, Senate Bill 273 and House Bill 1419, um, really made two changes. One is it changed the required amount of instructional time that's to be spent on the four core academic subjects at the elementary level. Um, and then at the same time, it also provided local school boards with the ability to count what in the legislation was called unstructured recreational time, but which everybody would, of course, will refer to as recess, um, the flexibility to count that towards instructional time and towards teaching hours. Second bill uh, to highlight is House Bill 81, um, which well, we will not need for a very, 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 very long time, I'm sure. However, um, it does grant local school boards an additional, uh, the ability to ask for an additional 180 days when going through the process of hiring a uh, school superintendent. Um, it's flexibility that wasn't there before. The entire process had to take 180 days and there was uh, no, no chance for appeal. This allows the opportunity to, if necessary, continue that process on beyond the original 180 days. Uh, an issue that was brought up in a couple of different uh, times already today. Uh, this legislation it deals with, with the procedures that are uh, set forward in the code on student truancy in terms of how you are to intervene for student absences uh, or unexcused absences. Uh, this legislation adjusts some of the timelines. Uh, the original, uh, the code had some very strict guidelines and very strict uh, kind of stair-step approach to ev after every um, absence, there was a different type of intervention. Um, the way the legislation uh, or the code has been changed gives a lot more flexibility to localities to be able to uh, focus their interventions more at the school level, especially initial interventions. Uh, and it also takes away an automatic referral to the courts. It does give discretion to the school systems to determine which, uh, which cases are uh, warrant that or which cases warrant additional intervention at the school level. House Bill 1125 and House Senate Bill 349 um, are, and you can see from the number of bullets that I've listed here, and that doesn't even give you everything that these pieces of legislation did. Um, this was really a comprehensive attempt to uh, address the teacher sh teaching shortage throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, so there are a number of changes, and really most of the changes here are additional flexibilities that are granted to school divisions in terms of hiring teachers. Um, everything from an extension of a renewable license to go from five to 10 years, um, allowing to, uh, a teacher who's seeking a provisional license to actually be able to fulfill some of the requirements of that license while they're um, working on the provisional license, um, and extensions of uh, the three-year provisional license in, in certain circumstances, it gives localities the ability to, to ask for those extensions. Um, it greatly simplifies licensure reciprocity uh, and makes it so that if somebody comes to Virginia from another state with a full license, essentially they'll have a full license here in Virginia. Um, there was legislation, separate legislation that dealt only with military spouses, but this legislation deals with everybody who comes to Virginia with a uh, with a, uh, a, a full license from another state. Uh, 
I, I could continue on, but as I said, this, this legislation does provide a great deal of additional flexibility in terms of our ability to, to uh, recruit and hire teachers. And it also does have a built-in um, built mechanism to look at the effects of the legislation. So once the legislation goes into effect, uh, there will be a look back period to see if these uh, changes have had the desired effect in terms of, of alleviating teacher shortage and, and those types of things. Okay, next bill, House Bill 1156, is also a licensure uh, bill, but this one dealt specifically with uh, requiring the state to create a dual language instruction uh, licensure endorsement. Um, there are some there are some specifics in the bill itself, but the, the State Board of Education will have the, the kind of the final say in terms of how they determine and how they draw up that license, but that licensure process will be uh, made available to school divisions. Uh, and then the next two bills really are more process types of things. Uh, Senate Bill 716 is asking for uh, recommendations from the Department of State Police on in terms of performing background checks. I know that's one of the, the biggest uh, kind of, not hurdles, but one of the, the, the biggest time impediments in terms of, of vetting new teachers. Uh, so this is asking for some ideas in terms of how to speed up that process. And then also some, uh, some paperwork reduction in terms of allowing for employment verification. So those, all of those pieces of legislation relate directly back to positions that you all have taken as a board. Um, either they stem directly from the position you took or they were directly related to a position they already had. Uh, now we're gonna get into some other pieces of legislation that will have an impact on FCPS. Uh, first of which is uh, two pieces of legislation which deal with the release of student directory information. Um, what House Bill 1 does is it changes what is currently an opt-out procedure into an opt-in procedure for the release of student address, phone number, and email address to organizations outside the school system. Obviously, the internal communications remain the same, but in terms of releasing to outside organizations, there's going to have to be an affirmative parental um, opt-in for those, for those releases. Senate Bill 512 really was a companion to that. It basically said that you couldn't ask, uh, that pursuant to a FOIA request, you couldn't release that information unless you had affirmative parent, um, uh, parent permission. So both of those deal with the, the release of student directory information. House Bill 1085 uh, deals with military students and it requires school divisions to have a policy allowing for the possible um, changing of, of a base school for a student if they, um, if they fulfill a particular set of, of uh, requirements. It's important to note that the bill does leave the set of requirements to local school boards to determine what they are. Uh, so your current student transfer policy would, would probably be sufficient in terms of fulfilling the requirement to have a policy for students to be able to apply to go to schools outside of their uh, attendance area. And Senate Bill 775, I think, just mirrors some uh, existing practices that FCPS already, uh, already follows in terms of not charging uh, tuition to students who either at the end of a school year or their, their parents are deployed or their parents are moved to another duty station or they're coming into a school system at the beginning of a school year, possibly a little bit before their parent actually arrives because of the duty requirements. The next two bills deal with uh, student discipline and they touch on both long-term and short-term suspensions. House Bill 1600 actually reduces the maximum, uh, the maximum duration of a student suspension from 364 calendar days to only 45 school days with the very important caveat, unless the offense that is being discussed involves weapons, drugs, serious bodily injury, or the school board or superintendent finds aggravating circumstances exist. So there are a number of circumstances under which there, you'd still be able to go beyond 45 days, but the, the bar right now would be set at 45 days unless the offense involved one of those areas. Uh, similarly, Senate Bill 170 actually uh, touches on short-term suspensions for our younger students. 
Uh, so students in grades preschool through grade three uh, could not be suspended for more than three days unless the offense uh, involved a similar list of, uh, of, uh, of offenses, firearms, drugs, criminal acts, uh, physical harm, credible threats of physical harm, or aggravating circumstances. Now, one thing we don't know yet because, the, uh, because this is, was left to the Virginia Department of Education is exactly what an aggravating circumstance will be, would be considered. Um, during the General Assembly session, the, the example was given of a student who may have done the same thing four or five times. That may be considered an aggravating circumstance, that they've been disciplined multiple times for exactly the same type of offense. Um, but again, that will be left to the Virginia Department of Education to define. Next two uh, sets of legislation deal with uh, student transportation. The first one deals with uh, school bus driver requirements and really is a mirror to the legislation that I was telling you about earlier that dealt with student or with uh, teacher licensure. Uh, it actually, uh, in essence, reduces the, the minimum requirements that are in state or in state regulation right now uh, for the amount of time that has to be spent with behind the wheel training and the amount of time that has to be spent for classroom training um, for both uh, d potential drivers who already have a, a commercial driver's license and those who do not. Um, this was legislation that was brought by some rural school divisions in particular um, that have a, a very, very difficult time finding drivers. Um, so they were looking for some relief from, uh, from the, the requirements for school bus drivers. The second legislation listed here is Senate Bill 229, and this will require any, anybody who is involved in the transportation of students with autism to undergo uh, training uh, in, in autism spectrum disorders. Um, I am told that the Department of Education already has, I think it's a two hour long vi uh, video module that's already available um, to school divisions to make use of, um, but that th there is the new requirement that that, be, uh, that, that training be given to both drivers and also uh, assistants that deal with students and, and transportation. I could, I promise you, go on and on and on and on about legislation, but I won't. I did want to give you this table just to, uh, again, give you an idea of the, the, the vast number of subjects that the General Assembly deals with and the vast number of subjects that affect you as a board you know, you, you, you think of, of the General Assembly and legislation and you think about bills dealing with the standards of learning, you, deal, you think about those types of things, but they deal with legislation that has an effect upon you in, in many, many different ways. Uh, wireless communications infrastructure, so uh, kind of the build out, this is aimed I think more at the build out of the 5G, uh, the, the new wireless spectrum. Um, but it has an impact on, on possible rights of ways and it has an impact on those types of things. Uh, school meals policies in terms of what uh, school divisions can and cannot do to, um, uh, to, to collect student debt or to let, at least let parents know that, that uh, students, um, maybe their meal account is, has been de depleted. Um, drones, of all things, was a, a significant discussion in the General Assembly this year uh, in terms of the ability of localities and the ability of school boards um, to regulate the use of drones on their property. And in fact, this legislation um, does not allow you to regulate the, uh, the, the use of drones on, on property. Um, but I'm told that that is going to be a continued discussion. It, that's, it certainly wasn't the last word in, in legislation this year. Okay, so that's what did happen. Now I have a very similar table of what didn't happen. Again, sometimes some of the most interesting things that happen in the General Assembly are bills that don't pass because they're discussions of issues that may arise in the future or discussions of issues that may be, uh, that may be of interest to, to folks in other parts of the Commonwealth uh, but may not necessarily be an issue for us here. Um, so bills that we've seen multiple times in the past, uh, the Tebow bill is the, deal, the bill dealing with homeschool participation in high school sports. Uh, there were bills dealing with commercial advertising on school buses, on uh, the possible giving uh, parents education savings accounts to be able to go and, and use those for, for private school tuition or for homeschool tuition. Um, just to highlight three in particular on here because they will continue to be issues. Uh, 
One is the open meeting comment period legislation. Uh, there were bills that would require school boards to have uh, comment periods at every open meeting they have. Um, so it would mean not only would you have to have open comment like you do at this meeting, but also at work sessions and also at anything that was considered a school board meeting. Um, those pieces of legislation did not go forward, but they were referred to the Virginia FOIA Council. And so they will be discussed in the off session and it's something that we'll obviously be, be watching as it goes forward. Um, another bill to, to be aware of is a, a bill that would have required, uh, would have specifically written into code that the only way to verify the history or social science credit was to actually take a standardized SOL test. Um, right now the code is, is kind of silent in terms of how you actually verify credits and the State Board of Education in fact is going in a very opposite direction of that which is to allow for the use of performance-based assessments and even allowing for the possibility of local performance-based assessments. Um, I'm highlighting this for you because even though the legislation did not go forward, there was language in the budget. And as you will hear in a few minutes, the budget's not done. So we still don't know if that language will stay in the budget. So that could still be uh, a possibility of something that happens uh, in, in terms of, um, of legislation. Now, during the session, that legislation did change. It was essentially a, a, a bar against using performance-based assessments in general for uh, verifying a history of social science SOL credit. There was kind of a compromise that was reached that would allow for a state um, developed and a state scored performance-based assessment, but not for locally developed and scored performance-based assessments. So again, that's one that we need to, to be paying attention to as part of the budget process because it did have budget language. And then finally, Labor Day, which of course is everybody's favorite uh, topic, which uh, is, is, is a perennial issue. The reason that I'm highlighting it, however, is because things were a little different this year. Um, the last number of years, Labor Day bills, and there really are kind of two types. One is just an outright repeal of Labor Day, the Labor Day restriction. Just give localities the ability to set the calendar how they want to. There, the last couple of years, there has been kind of a, what's been shopped as a bit of a compromise proposal that said, okay, we'll allow school divisions to set their own calendar. However, if they choose to set the calendar to start before Labor Day, they would have to give an extended weekend around the Labor Day holiday. So, you know, maybe a Friday through a Monday or, you know, so a, a four day weekend or something around the Labor Day holiday. The interesting thing about that legislation is it passed in the House and it went to the Senate where it traditionally does, isn't successful. The Senate, instead of just outright defeating it, did carry it over. And when they carried it over, there was a very specific instruction to all of us in the room. And when I say all of us, the tourism industry that was on this side of the room and the education industry that was on this side of the room for us to talk to each other in the off session and come back with a compromise which may very well look like that legislation that requires that extended, uh, extended holiday. That really is the first time in my memory in dealing with this issue, and I've been doing this for longer than I really care to admit, um, that there's been an opening to, ha to have that discussion between the two parties that are really at odds on, on that issue. Um, so obviously that's something we're, we're definitely gonna take advantage of in the off session and having that conversation. But I wanted to highlight, even though it didn't succeed this year like it hasn't in the past, um, the conversation was different. Okay, what's next? Well, I just gave you the highlights of probably 20, 25, 30 bills that passed. Um, I have a report that has about 30 pages worth of bills that passed. Um, right now, staff is very diligently looking through all of them to determine what we may need to do here. In a lot of cases, we were already fully in compliance. In a lot of cases, it gives us flexibility we didn't have before. But in some cases, it might require some additional, uh, some changes at the local level in, in terms of regulations, in terms of policies, in terms of procedures. So that work is continuing on um, legislation that passes during the general assembly session unless it specifically says so in the legislation goes into effect on july 1 of 2018 um, there still are some bills and i had mentioned the definition of uh, extenuating circumstances is one example of this uh, we know the legislation's passed 
but we can't tell you the exact impact of it until that regulatory process happens and they define extenuating circumstances or they develop the actual licensure requirements for the dual licensure. Um, so some things, even though they are completed from a legislative standpoint, still will be a little bit up in the air as the, Board of the Virginia Board of Education does their work. Um, legislation that is continued, um, technically they, the General Assembly has to act on it by November 29th, 2018. Um, contrary to popular belief, the General Assembly does continue to meet even though they're out of session. They have, um, the, the committees will meet and they, they can act on legislation. The vast majority of bills that are continued just go away, essentially. And if the legislator wants to bring them back in 2019, they can obviously bring them back. They don't go through the formal process of, of the continuation. Um, because essentially all a continuation does is say, for example, it was continued by the House Education Committee and they decided to continue it. Well, it would go to the 2019 session having passed the House Education Committee, which means it would still have to pass in the full House, would still have to go to the Senate and still have to go through Senate Education and Health, pass the full Senate and be signed by the governor. So it essentially has to go through the same process. So they usually don't continue. But as I said, it's a process that they sometimes use on legislation to kind of signal that they want to have additional discussion on it. Um, and that lovely report and, and all other information on legislation is always available on our uh, FCPS Office of Government Relations website. And then, finally, budget special session. As I mentioned, the General Assembly is almost done, but they did not complete the biennial budget. Um, what they did was they went into a special session the House has already repassed essentially their version of the budget. Uh, the Senate is not scheduled to come back to consider that until May 14th. Um, I say that because the current budget as it exists now really does expire on June 30th. So there is not all that much time, and I'm sure you're all very aware in terms of adopting your own budget and then the county adopting their budget, um, that there's not a ton of time between May 14th and June 30th. Uh, at this point, you all probably know as much or more than I do in terms of where the budget process is and who is thinking what and what the Senate might do. Uh, we know what the House has done. The House has already re kind of reaffirmed the position that it took during the session. Um, but you know, everybody kind of is waiting with bated breath in terms of what the Senate will do. Um, as I said, the General Assembly does not stop its work just because it's out of session. Um, in addition to committees meeting, uh, in fact, uh, today, uh, starting at 1.30, I think I left Richmond at 4.30 today to make it here, which is why Ms. Strauss was uh, very kind in making sure that I was actually here. Uh, the first meeting of the House Select Committee on School Safety was today. Um, that that's the committee that was set up by the, the Speaker of the House to look at school safety issues. Uh, really, today was an organizational meeting. Um, to let you know, they did break into three distinct separate um, subcommittees, one really de dealing with physical security, so building security and those types of things, one dealing with student mental health and student wellness, and then one dealing with policies and procedures for things like active shooter drills and those types of things. So they're really going to look at those three areas separately. Um, we do have three legislators on, those, on, on the full committee. Uh, I believe uh, Delegate Watts is on the Student Health and Wellness Committee, and Delegates Krechek and um, uh, Mark Sickles are on the, the one looking at policies and procedures. So we didn't, none of, none of our three Fairfax people ended up on the safety, or in the, the physical security, um, but obviously we'll have input in all three of those areas. Uh, I listed a couple of other things that are happening over the, uh, the off session that we, we know specifically about. Uh, the Senate has set up a school facility modernization subcommittee. We have, I think, three senators on that. Uh, Senate local government committee is, is doing what they are coll colloquially referring to as the proffer party. Uh, if you remember a couple of years ago, there was some pretty sweeping legislation restricting the use of proffers in localities. Uh, this is their opportunity to kind of do a look back to see what the impacts have been and look at possible changes going forward. Um, and then the Joint Subcommittee on Local Government Fiscal Stress. Uh, that subcommittee may very well look at issues dealing with the local composite index dealing with local taxing authority. And the reason that I say that is because there were bills dealing with both of those subjects that were, didn't pass, 
but were passed by with a letter, and that letter went to the Joint Subcommittee on Local Government Fiscal Stress to look at those issues. Um, and then, of course, the whole thing starts all over again, July 16th, 2018, legislators can start putting in their bill ideas for the 2019 session. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Berlein. We appreciate you driving back from Richmond to get here today. Thank you. I have a number of uh, board members who would like to ask questions. I have Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Evans, Ms. Polchak, Ms. Schultz, and if others wish to speak, turn on your light. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that very much, Michael. Um, I first do want to echo the shout outs this evening to our more recess in Fairfax County advocates. Uh, you uh, parents are just phenomenal. And you took an issue that um, I know this board is so supportive of, but we recognize some of the limitations at the state level. And you were just remarkable in your relentless advocacy down there. And we're very grateful for your hard work. And uh, having met with some of you just this week, um, Dr. Brabrand, I want to tell you how much I appreciate Noel Clemenko of your staff with Instructional Services, um, Dr. Presidio, um, that you know, the, the administration now is really wanting to work on how we can uh, really take advantage of these positive changes. And so I, I did want to give my nod of appreciation to the superintendent and, and team because that's really what this is about. It's partnering with our community, continuously improving the education that we give our children. And you guys are just a fantastic example of, of really how we allow Fairfax County to continue to be one of the best places to send your children. So bravo to you guys. And I hope it means you're gonna have some more time with your children now that you're not down in Richmond um, doing such hard, hard work. Um, and Michael, thank you for, for your efforts on that as well. It's very much appreciated. Um, I, I could ask a lot of questions, but that's not fair to my colleagues and uh, the late hour. So I'm gonna go to two things. One, uh, the electronic communications meeting and FOIA, um, House bills 906, 907, 908. Uh, again, I don't wanna take up time tonight, but it was on your list of approved bills. And I know for our board, that's always something we're really wanting to better understand. So I would just uh, make the humble request to our chair and vice chair that, um, it, you know, if you can direct us to the best summary of what that outcome means. I know you mentioned staff will um, be briefing us as well, um, but I would say that's probably, if there's anything significant that's come out of it, it would be nice to get that sooner rather than later. Just in real brief terms, one of the bills um, kind of expands the definition of electronic communications, so it updates it up, updates some outdated code uh, to deal with texting and, and some other issues along those lines. Um, two of the bills actually, interestingly, contradict each other. Mm. Um, so they will have to go to what's called the Virginia Code Commission to determine how to reconcile the two pieces of legislation, and they deal with participation in electronic meetings from remote sites. Um, they were looking yeah. to update some of the requirements dealing with you know, the ability to, to call into meetings types of things. Yeah. Um, but they do, they do in some ways contradict each other. Sure, and I understand obviously then our general counsel is gonna need to you know, look to see what happens with that sort of reconciliation, but I would ask if you can partner with our division council, whichever one isn't in conflict, uh, the sooner that we're updated on that, uh, it will help our board. You know, um, and then the other thing, as you know, is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I really do want to meet with you offline and, and get some intentional uh, work on this. And that has to do with our school nurses. And for my colleagues who maybe you're not as familiar in this area, uh, but right now, um, the Virginia Commonwealth does not recognize our school nurses under our um, SOQs. And so as a result, uh, it's not something that we automatically would get state funding for. Um, the uh, National Association of, school, of uh, Nursing um, Professions in this country have recommended that school divisions have one school nurse for every 750 students. Um, actually, that's also what the Commonwealth recommends, and currently Fairfax County Public Schools has one in 3,000. So part of the piece of it is even for our board is, uh, you know, and our school division is 
how do we even follow the guidelines that we've gotten from the state, which were grossly understaffed for that. And I think that's going to be a shared effort with the Board of Supervisors because we rely on their support for our, uh, from our Department of Public Health. So as Michael knows, I was working with my delegate to see what we could do. And when she spoke to Michael, um, the, the concern was that as of now, Fairfax County Public Schools has concerns about unfunded mandates, so it's hard to get behind it. So um, again, just to kind of give you a heads up, mm -hmm. I really think this is something we need to do some work on um, in preparation for the next General Assembly. Uh, I would like to best understand, um, since you do represent the division, but that also includes the school board, um, that we need to uh, really take a lead on something that is so important to the health and well-being of students. We're talking about um, community schools, and nothing speaks better to a community schools model than having uh, a full-time health care um, provider uh, to help the, the tremendous growing needs of um, the students in our schools. So those are kind of the big things that I kind of wanted to touch on uh, with you, Michael. And uh, otherwise, I appreciate this very thorough briefing because it's so important for this board to understand what's the outcome and, and what we can expect the changes happening to our division as a result. Clearly, it was a busy General Assembly. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Malloy, for all your great work uh, in the General Assembly and with the General Assembly. I know how it's uh, difficult to, to keep track of this many bills uh, in, <laughs> in a short, very concentrated uh, period of time, and you do a great job. Um, a lot of positive news this year, mm -hmm. uh, not, not um, completely, uh, but a, a lot of good things. And um, I will also highlight the recess and kudos to the advocates for initiating this with our legislators and um, uh, succeeding in, in getting this done. And um, I'm delighted that uh, the conversation has started. And thank you, Ms. McLaughlin, for uh, being part of that conversation with staff on how we can best use this flexibility, um, hopefully as early as next fall, because uh, now that we have the flexibility, absolutely let's, let's use it. Um, so I hope that can move forward very, very quickly. Um, as the liaison to SHAC, I also uh, want to be sure that that, that organization, um, that that group is is aware and and weighing in and that we can um, deal with any policy issues if we can uh, make policy changes at the same time but as long as the superintendent and staff can move forward that's great so kudos to all of, of you for that it's such an important health issue and one that we've been working on for quite some time um, trying to get um, more recess for our little ones you know that's that's so important for their bodies and their brains so I appreciate your advocacy and for bringing um, an excellent video with you tonight as well. Um, Michael, I had uh, one question on licensure, and uh, it may not be something that you can answer tonight. I see that we're supposed to, everybody's supposed to report back in uh, 2019 on impact. Have we done any kind of a rough cut on that in terms of how the changes, the, the many or the multiple changes in licensure would impact our vacancy rates or our, our hiring? Have we done any kind of a, a, a rough cut on that? I, I'm not aware of any at the staff level, however, because there are so many different moving pieces and there are right. places where we may decide to take advantage of the flexibility and others where we may not. Um, I think it's, you know, it's still gonna require some staff work to piece through all the different changes. Because as I said, even though I gave you a long list, there are other things in that legislation that, that uh, are, are being changed. Um, so in terms of the sum total of how it's going to impact, I don't think we're able to say anything about that yet. But all of it's in the direction of flexibility, correct, in terms of... Yeah, I believe, I believe in that so legislation that, so it was it should, all... it should help us or at least not hurt us, but... Um, and I, I will be very interested to see what, uh, what the impact's going to be in terms of uh, being able to continue licensure um, beyond a certain time and uh, have a, a, a little bit more flexibility, because that 
with the teacher shortage that um, the entire country faces, that's, that's going to be really important to, to be able to uh, use whatever flexibility we have there. So uh, it's unfortunate that they, they didn't pass the repeal of the King's Dominion law, but it sounds like they're moving in the right direction, and that's, um, that's very positive, so we'll keep an eye on that. And um, lastly, I certainly certainly hope that the General Assembly does uh, succeed in um, uh, Medicaid expansion. I guess we will know that in the next in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so I, I'm I'm glad to see that at least there um, uh, at least there's a possibility of that, and hopefully uh, that we we get that done. So again, thank you for all your work and for this report, Ms. Balchuk. Hi, thank you, Michael. Um, I, I just echo my colleagues. Thank you for all you do. I know you're quite busy down there and represent not just us, but the education community of Virginia. Um, a couple of quick things. Would it be possible to get the full list of the members serving on those select committees? I know they're looking at oh, quite a few things. I would love yeah, that. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Thank yeah, you. They've, uh, I think they've released, uh, they, as I said, they had the first meeting of the, the House Select Safety Committee. Um, the the senators that are on the school modernization committee, um, actually uh, Senator Dave Marsden is a co-chair of that committee and okay. Senator Barbara Favola and uh, Senator Scott Suraville are both serving on that committee as well. Okay. So we have three, three Fairfax uh, related uh, right. senators on that one as well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you could send this for this committee, sure. that would be wonderful. Um, another question, I was talking to my delegate about this. Do you feel that there's um, appetite or can we start to increase the conversation um, around possibly increasing funding for mental health support, counseling, social workers in schools? Was there any conversation around that? There was some. I think where you're going to see that conversation is as part of this school safety committee. Um, as I said, they, they have an entire subcommittee that's dedicated to student health and uh, and student mental uh, mental health. Uh, there were some statistics that were given today by the uh, Department of Criminal Justice Services in terms of threat assessments. So, you know, students that are identified as possibly being uh, of, of, of harm, and I think about 50% of all the students who were identified were at, at risk of harm to self, right. as opposed to external harm. So, you know, mental health, I think, will be uh, definitely part of that conversation. Uh, one thing I know that we brought up with our legislators in kind of some uh, preliminary discussions when we learned that they were part of this committee uh, was in 2009, the uh, General Assembly imposed what they call the support position cap. And it actually impacts um, school psychologists and school social workers because they fall under that cap. And it artificially limits the amount of funding that the state provides to localities. It used to be that the state would fund on the basis of prevailing practice. So whatever localities, how they staffed, that's how the state would reimbursed back to the localities with that cap, that link between what was actually happening at the local level and what the state would fund was severed. And you know, it was, I think, about $300 million a year for all support positions that was lost. Um, and that's been every year since 2009, that $300, $300 million just compounds, compounds, compounds. Um, so that's definitely something that we brought up with them. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful. And anything, you know, we can do, especially since it's a select committee, we'd mm -hmm. like to know what they're working on immediately. Um, let us know if you have further information. Um, and then uh, a little bit more, I guess, for our staff related to what you said, would it be possible, and I see that Norm is here from SEPTA, um, I guess more for Jeff Plattenberg, to get information on current training we do offer to all transportation personnel working with our uh, special needs population autism spectrum, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, thank you to our recess community. I know I, I, I've only had time to answer emails at the end of the school year. I appreciate all you do. Um, and I know Scott was having meetings with staff. So I don't know if we have a, a timeline or a sense of when you think you'll be able to get back to us with recommendations um, for next year. Oh, recess. The green. Yes, we we are processing all of the General Assembly changes, recommendations. We do have groups already meeting, and I hope to have I will have a recommendation available for the community and the board prior to the end of the school year to impact next year. There are going to be no changes for 
the remainder of this year. Right. Um, but we're working on that, and I, I should have something out before the close of the year. Okay. Thank you. Looking forward to that, and thank you, and I hope you get a little bit of rest, Michael. Thanks. Ms. Schultz? So I have, I'm going to sort of be a little bit less loquacious and more peppering because I have some specific questions. One, did we champion the um, extension for this 180 day superintendent extension? I mean, was that, yeah, it, did we it was, put that it was in? Carried, it was carried by a Fairfax legislator. And it okay. was, it can was, you please just for the public explain because that like that sort of gets lost the 180 day cutoff at the end of a superintendent search. Can you just expand why that's important? What happens at the end of that and why an extension is necessary? The, the reason an extension is necessary is in, so to, to start from the beginning, in code there is a specific timeline that school that boards have to follow in terms of superintendent hiring. Um, that process has to complete after 180 days. If that process does not complete after 180 days, it's actually the state superintendent of public instruction that gets to appoint a superintendent for the local school board. Um, 180 days sounds like a ton of time, but as you are all very well aware, if you are trying to do a nationwide search, if you are trying to do site visits, if you are trying to interview multiple candidates, 180 days is eaten up very, very quickly. Um, it may not be an issue in smaller school divisions, but definitely for larger school divisions that do those comprehensive types of searches and have community focus groups, 180 days goes quickly. Um, this just gives flexibility, and, and it's actually automatic flexibility if a school board requests an additional 180 days, they will simply be granted. Okay, that, it's not. That's so important because yeah literally the way the law used to be that at the end of 180 days without appeal mm -hmm. without any i mean there's nothing that can be done a school division gives up its right to select the board gives up its right to select its superintendent it's turned over to the state board of education and the state superintendent and board of education pick your superintendent for you Correct. so that was a very like I, look I, I've not been particularly f a fan of our lack of legislative wins. That's a huge one. I mean, I hope we never, ever, ever have to take advantage of it, but that's a huge, important win to have. Um, I didn't see anything in there about long-term subs, and maybe we didn't advocate for it, but um, I, I know that there's a problem about an another, an automatic cutoff on a long-term sub who isn't certified. I think it's not, they don't, they're not certified and there's nothing we can do. And, you know, I've had many of my schools have come up against this. It could be that um, there's a teacher that's out on long-term, they may be dealing with an aging parent or a, a family member who has a, a serious illness, and you get somebody in there and they get the, the class going and then everything grinds to a halt because then just by because because there's this demarcation line we got to get rid of them was there anything like that contemplated uh, the only legislation dealing with long-term subs actually went the opposite direction that you're talking about but was withdrawn by the patrons because um, uh, upon further discussion with their school system that wasn't what they were trying to accomplish i think they were trying to accomplish more along the lines of what you're referring to um, because there are some artificial there are some artificial limitations in terms of the use of uh, long-term substitutes. Dr. Rayburn. Ms. Schultz, I'm glad I, this had not been brought to my attention this year. Um, this is something I was familiar with when I was in the system as a principal and an administrator, and I may have some solutions to resolve that short of General Assembly um, intervention. So if you could send me the specifics, I will follow up with Dr. Ramey and see what we can do well, around Well, that's good. I'd that. rather not have, I mean, I'm like smaller government, so I'd rather not have a legal, dis, you know, but if there's a workaround, those artificial, that's too bad you have to leave the classroom immediately because you're on your last day. I, that, does, that doesn't work for me. Can I ask you a question about the HB 1085, which is the military student um, uh, bill? Yes. Uh, what was trying, what were they trying to accomplish? I'm still, I have sort of, I'm a little bit quivering around that a military, I'm not, and I, lo I love me and my military families, but that you can just place anywhere. And I'm, I'm still a little bit unclear about what that bill is about. And I'm wondering if that was really directed at districts someplace else in the state. The, the original legislation did come out of the Tidewater area, obviously with uh, tons of military families. Um, and it was a, it was a blanket uh, open enrollment 
policy. The original legislation as introduced was simply any student living on a military base or anybody, or anybody living uh, in military housing could go to any school they wanted to in their school division. Was that period. to avoid a failing school? Um, I, anecdotally, it, there are situations in, in other districts where there's a school that the base feeds to that they may not be wanting to go to. I mean, I'm sure that that happens everywhere. Um, I don't know the specifics of exactly you know, what precipitated it, but I know that was the kind of idea behind the legislation. And in practice, how is this going to work? In practice, it's going to be left to local school boards to determine uh, their own policies in terms of, of student transfers, which is why, which is, and, and it specifically says in the legislation that subject to any condition is deemed appropriate by the local school board. Well, that seems like that was a useless bill. <laughs> if, if we get to make up the rules at each individual, the, you, should, I, I you should come to the General uh, Assembly with me sometime. Whatever. <laughs> um, it's a, yeah, anyway. Legislators passing useless bills is not a shock. Um, uh, discipline, uh, uh, boy, what a major kudos to drop the long-term suspension from 364 to 45. I don't know who championed it. I don't know how many people voted for it. I'm going to go take a look. But that is, that is a sea change in messaging about how we treat minor children and that minor children are not criminals. So I'm thrilled with... Um, not, they're not, sometimes they're criminals, <laughs> not always, but that, that we're not criminalizing being a child, um, absent, you know, exigent circumstances. So I'm thrilled with that. Um, on the HB 810 SB 557 on the drivers, I was confused. The end of that one said, um, and people who don't have commercial bus or commercial driver's licenses, do pe are people driving school buses without commercial driver's licenses? I think they actually have to get their commercial driver's license as part of the process. So there's processes longer than someone who already holds a commercial driver's license. That's, that's why there's a difference in how they treat somebody who has one and somebody who doesn't have one because they have but to our, receive our, it as part uh, of it. Our bus drivers have a commercial driver's license, right? They're required by law, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, in your additional, the table at the end where it's just like kind of the catch-all, yeah. um, there was a... a square there that said dual enrollment. Can you just, that's a big thing with a lot of my constituents and my students. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about what those were? They were uh, fairly comprehensive bills and they dealt with dual enrollment uh, kind of, um, and it, it, it dealt with K-12, community college and higher ed. Um, the main focus of those bills really was actually articulation agreements between um, community colleges and higher education. The reason the dual enrollment gets pulled into that is because a lot of students in the community college system use dual enrollment credits as part of their graduation requirements to fulfill their two-year requirements in the community college. So they're, they're looking to make sure that there's alignment between K-12 provided dual enrollment courses, courses provided at the community college level, and then courses provided at the, high, at the, at the, um, the, the four-year institutions so that there's kind of a seamless articulation between the three. Where that may have an impact on us, obviously, is in terms of staffing because we have some different staffing requirements in, ter in, terms, of requ in, in terms of the licensure requirements that there are for being able to do a, a dual enrollment course. So there was nothing um, necessarily in this that helped facilitate more um, dual enrollment. It's more just making sure credits carry through. It's more of a standardization. Mm, okay. Um, Labor Day, seven years. <laughs> Seven years I've been waiting for good news on <laughs> Labor Day. That's, I, I mean, it's not, it's not 18. a no, so I'll take it. <laughs> it's not a no, so that's, that is some good, good news. And whatever Dr. Brabrand, um, Doc, um, I don't know who else did it, um, uh, uh, Mr. Foster, whatever is necessary between now and when did you say November 29th? Whatever is necessary, I am in Lake Flynn on that one. So um, I, I'm happy to help. I am concerned um, looking at our budget timeline. I'm extremely concerned. Dr. Brabrand and everyone, money. Um, our school um, uh, work session is on May 14th. They're meeting on May 14th. 
I don't know how we hold to this budget calendar. I'm very concerned that May 14th is the, and that's not a decision. That's when they're starting that, to meet. And actually just the Senate meeting. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, and then, and then we're, how are we, how are we gonna hold a, a public hearing the next day, May 15th and 16th? No. Um, the day after that, a work session, May 17th? No. And we've got to vote on it by May 24th. So I think there has to be some serious discussion about changing our budget work timeline. So, so Ms. Schultz, uh, we met with the budget chair and vice chair today, Mr. Moon and Ms. Evans, and uh, we'll be prepared to have some discussion about this as our budget work session uh, next week. Um, and uh, we have some ideas about how to uh, mitigate some of the issues. We're concerned too. We want the General Assembly to wrap up its business so local government, local schools can make final determinations. But we have some ideas and I think the board will be uh, interested in uh, uh, what we've looked at. Okay, I'll be interested. And then the last question I have, um, so, so what was that last thing you said? Can you tell us a little bit about what, um, can you pull up your last, your very last slide? Very last slide. Last bullet, last slide. And I didn't even count the bullets this time. Um, joint Subcommittee on Local Government Fiscal Stress. Yes. LCI. What is that? Who's on it? And I mean, look, the LCI is the fascizzle in this whole discussion because until the LCI changes, nothing changes. 87 cents on a dollar gets redistributed from the taxpayers from Fairfax County to everyone else. And to me, that was always like, you know, the sacred cow, it's never coming back because other jurisdictions would have to choose to give up some of our money and be more self-reliant and tax their citizens more and give us back more of our money for that LCI to change. Uh, who, do we have anybody favorable on that, on that subcommittee? Well, to give you the background of that subcommittee, that uh, I actually don't know off the top of my head all of the members that are on that subcommittee, but I do know that that subcommittee was created actually out of the, um, the fiscal crisis that happened in Petersburg in terms of they were running up to the point where they weren't actually going to be able to pay their own bills. Um, so this subcommittee was, was uh, de designed to look at that. They've expanded their... Um, their look, obviously, because they're pulling in things like local, local composite index, uh, the possibility of equalizing local taxing authority between what cities already have available to them and giving that type of... Uh, so the real bellwether on, on this is any fix is going to be a, still a fix for all the other jurisdictions. Not, there's like not, I, look, I want to cut to the quick any hope that this is going to result in an LCI like recalculation that winds up better for us. Well, the problem is, is that you have 131 other discussions exactly like this one. And if you take this discussion anywhere other than a high local composite index jurisdiction, they're having a conversation about how the LCI is unfair to them because they don't get more money from the state because for example, their, their land that they have put aside in uh, tax abatements is, is taxed too high. So they're their wealth is too high, so their local composite index is too high, so they should be getting more money from the state. Okay. So it really depends on where you sit as to where you land on the local composite index. All right, index. I'm just gonna snuff out the flame of hope. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just so everybody knows where they are on the line, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Hines, Ms. Turner, Colfax, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I'll be brief. Um, Michael, thank you. Thank you so much for all you do, um, not only for our school system, but for the leadership you take for all of the school systems across the state. It's greatly appreciated. Um, it looks like this has been a very productive but frustrating uh, legislative season. Um, however, in the look forward, there are some really positive and interesting things going on. And so rather than um, focusing on what has already been adopted, um, I'd like to just focus a bit on these committees that are being um, developed, especially on the school safety. Um, as you know, we had a very productive meeting with the three Northern Virginia legislators who are on um, the school safety committee. Uh, a couple of days ago with uh, my colleague, Mrs. Derenak Koufax and I, because the three legislators, as was quite humorous, they said, you know, we, we represent the same area and it's the Mount Vernon and Lee area. Um, so it, 
proved to be a very good conversation, and I feel lucky that Fairfax County has the three on these committees. Um, interestingly, that they have focused on the mental health piece and on options um, rather than the actual physical security um, so for, for our folks. So that is an area that I think is going to be really important to watch, but also to see how we can dovetail the work that is being done um, by Mr. Plattenberg and uh, Mr. Vaccarello in the review of all of our own safety and security procedures and coming back to us with what are the best practices and what recommendations. And I know that that delegation looks forward to hearing from us after we get those results. So um, I think that's important. I would like to know a little bit more on um, your last bullet where you are second to the last, the local government proffer party. That is the chairman's name. I, we, didn't, we didn't make it up. That was the chairman's name. Um, if you remember in 2016, legislation was passed that, that greatly curtailed the ability of localities to request proffers, which are uh, basically payments from developers uh, to help mitigate some of the impacts that the development might have on services within a locality, so whether it be schools or roads or those types of things. Um, the reason they're calling it the proffer party is a little bit like the conversation that they had with the education advocates and the tourism advocates on Labor Day, was they wanted to make sure that they got everybody in the same room to have a conversation about how the law is working, how the law is not working, and what changes need to be make, made going forward. So have we put together our wish list for that? I have not. Uh, the, the county obviously, are, they, they kind of take the lead on, on these issues because the, the proffers really falls more, you know, we're, we're a beneficiary of the proffers, but the proffer process really is more of a local government focus. Um, but I'm, you know, we'll, we'll be working with them in terms of determining, uh, they, they have their own wish list and I know that, that you know, additional proffers and the additional ability to, to, to ask for proffers for schools and for other services are, are definitely on their list. I would encourage, and I don't know how we do this, but I think it's going to be really important for us to put our wish list together. Um, I had the pleasure of serving as one of the liaisons to the Schools Committee of the Planning Commission last year, and I know that both uh, Ms. Palchuk and Ms. Evans are the liaisons this year, and that has uh, been looking, that group has looked at proffers because oftentimes in the way that our proffer legislation currently works, it does not look at the aggregate of multiple um, buildings going on. And so when you only look at the one-offs, you don't see the full picture. And so uh, I know that this is a conversation that I've had with Mr. Plattenberg and Mr. Sneed, but I would encourage uh, us to share how that works with people on that committee and uh, make sure they understand what the negative impact is for um, some of our areas that are having the most growth in a very rapid period of time. Thank you, and thanks again for all you do. Uh, Ms. Hines? Yes, hi. So in the category of bills that didn't pass, thankfully, <laughs> um, the one on the history social science required SOL uh, verified credit that um, I, I believe what you said was that there are people in the General Assembly who want to make sure that kids have to take an SOL in order for uh, or in order for that to be a verified credit correct in history social okay so um, that's worrisome because this is one of the things that I worry about is that the pendulum swings you know the way it does and I think that the Department of Education down there with help from our own staff, uh, leadership from our own staff, is, as you say, working very hard on replacing standardized tests with better assessments, right? Better, more meaningful assessments. So um, I, I don't want, I, I worry that this may be some sort of a sign that the people in Richmond have decided that the pendulum has swung quite enough that, that way, and now we're going to pull it back and start making everybody take more tests again. So, but I don't want to overreact. So. Can you have sort of a profile of the um, the people in the General Assembly who support this, where they come from, what they care about, and whether we think they have any sort of um, chance 
of winning this fight. And uh, also, I guess if I could get a sense of where the Department of Education, the Virginia Department of Education is on this, um, because I, I think, from what I understand, they currently would disagree with this change in the law. Well, in terms of, of the patron and the folks that are really talking about this, um, one thing to remember is that you still have a number of legislators that were there when the SOLs began. Um, and so they still have that view of accountability, that accountability has to be a standardized test and it has to be the exact same test on the exact same day to every student in the exact same way, or else you're not getting an accurate measure of student ability. Um, there's a great deal of concern that uh, if you go to kind of a locally verified or a, a locally developed, that you're going to have not one standard across the state, you're going to have 132 standards across the state. And they could be very, very different, whether you're here in Fairfax or you're somewhere else in, in Virginia. Um, so I think that that's, that's one of the lenses they look at this legislation through. Um, another is that it's, is, this is Virginia, and Virginia and civics, you really can't separate the two out. And there is a huge, you know, the number of legislators who serve on the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, and the number of legislators that are involved in, in, you know, all those kinds of activities, because this is such a hotbed of history and so much happened in Virginia, it has a special place in a lot of legislators' hearts, and they want to make sure that this content is taught, that, you know, uh, that, that students recognize the rich history in Virginia. So there's that tension between, you know, what a lot of the research is telling us that there are much better ways and there are different ways that you can do assessments. Um, and that, you know, a little bit older school version of, of how you do accountability and also the importance of civics. So those are the tensions that kind of run into each other when you get down to the General Assembly. Just to follow up a little bit, was it a close vote? I mean, uh, this, this actually was, the legislation itself was patroned by, um, uh, let me see, how, how shall I put this, a very powerful uh, senator um, who was very passionate about this issue and was very convincing to his colleagues. Um, it passed the Senate fairly easily, in fact, I think almost unanimously because there wasn't a lot of debate about it in the Senate. Um, when it got to the House, it did make it out of House education, but it, uh, it actually ended up dying in House appropriations because part of the legislation, because it talked about a statewide SOL assessment, the state was getting away from a statewide SOL assessment, so they needed an appropriation of money to kind of re redevelop and redesign their SOL. So that's one reason why this, and that's one reason why it was also embedded in the budget is because there was a fiscal impact on the state in terms of having to develop the, uh, the, uh, the new assessment. As I said, it started out as just a, a complete bar on any sort of performance-based assessments. The compromise that was struck, and you know, the Department of Education was involved in these conversations, uh, was to allow for a performance-based assessment, but it would have to be developed by the state and it would have to be scored centrally. It would not be, it wouldn't have the full flexibility that we think we have right now in terms of being able to do a locally developed assessment and a locally scored assessment. So that central, a cent centrally scored assessment was part of the bill that was not passed? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that was the, that was the final version of legislation that didn't make it out of appropriations, was oh. that version of a performance-based assessment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nikofix. Good evening, Mr. Malloy. Uh, hi. Um, thank you. I just want to say thank you for all that you do for us, and I appreciate your time and guidance um, that you spent uh, with Ms. Corbett Sanders and I and uh, the three state delegates on the House Select Committee on School Safety earlier this week. I, I appreciate you driving that, that, that carriage, so thank you so much. Um, I know the answer to this in the end, but I knowing a little bit about you know the way the committee structure works. In the beginning, the two things, I, I have similar concerns with what Ms. Schultz is talking about when we talk about the LCI, and we've often talked about how, you know, as it is, we can't change it, but can we add an addendum about poverty and you know schools at a certain level and how we can do that? I know in the end that didn't happen, but in the beginning, in the committees, when they're when that's out there, were, were those conversations held? And and more importantly, when we talk about 
you know, is there anyone down there championing that, wow, we're 43rd out of 50 in, in state funding for education? Are we talking, are they talking about that down there? And, and how does it kind of get from, yeah, that's the statistic that's been real and been honest for a long time. So the one is more aggregate statewide and the other is Fairfax specific. In terms of the LCI, the reason the LCI is such a difficult issue is because it interrelates the finances of every single school division in Virginia. And it compares the finances of every single school division in Virginia. So because it does that and because it compares property wealth and it compares uh, income tax and it compares sales tax and it compares, uh, you know, across the Commonwealth and doesn't account for things like service burden, so it doesn't account for populations of, of students in need. It doesn't account for cost of living. If you looked at the cost of living uh, statistics in Virginia, it's 30 to 40 percent higher to live in Northern Virginia pretty much than anywhere else in, in Virginia. That surprises my colleagues from Virginia Beach and Richmond and Henrico, but when you look at the statistics, the housing costs and other costs are substantially higher here, so it, it generates substantially higher wages. Uh, you should see the reaction of, of legislators from downstate when they hear what our, our you know, starting salaries are. Um, but they don't do the mental calculation of if you adjust that starting salary for your cost of living, that starting salary is actually below what your starting salary is. It's just we're talking in, in whole numbers and we're, we're looking at the actual purchasing power of those right. salaries. That's one reason why the LCI is such a difficult, uh, a difficult thing to get at. What you said about the statistics that were 43rd in the nation in terms of, of the state's effort towards public education, I think that's how you get at this issue, is because everybody has to benefit. If you pull at any thread in the local composite index, and there are bills every single year that pull at a thread of the local Great. composite index, and what happens is the Virginia Department of Education runs the numbers and shows Acomac, here's how much you get. Oh, it's more or less than what you got without this change. So automatically people go, I like this change because I do better. Okay. But there are 132 of us comparing our how we do. And usually it's a fairly even split in terms of who benefits and who doesn't benefit. Um, but adding more money to the system is what I think will help. Now, I know that, that that's not a perfect solution because all the statistics of us only getting you know, a few cents on the dollar back from Richmond, but if there's more money in the system, at least there's more money that's coming back to Fairfax, so there's more money that's available to all school divisions. And I think that's an easier lift than trying to get at that, you know, because it's a limited pie and because if you pull any string, somebody benefits and somebody doesn't benefit, you have school divisions working against each other. We are far stronger and all the kudos you've given me in terms of you know, the things that we do in Richmond, please know that there are a whole bunch of other folks down there that are advocating for education issues from other school divisions, from the school boards association, from the uh, superintendents association. I, I have a great partnership with a lot of different people that deal with education issues. We are much stronger when we're all pulling together when you get into the LCI, superintendents and the school boards association kind of have to sit off on the sidelines because they can't be championing, okay, half of my members do better and half of my members do worse. So it's left to school divisions and we're just left with what well, bottom line is we do better under this one and we do worse under this one. Well, that makes sense and it's a good strategy for next year and, and beyond. But I think, you know, that because that statistic remains alarming, I think it actually went down. I think a few years ago we were 41st or 42nd. Um, so thank you again, Michael. And to the ladies behind you, shout out for mom power and for all you do to believe it can get done. So congratulations. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. We really do appreciate your work on our behalf. And I know that Many other school divisions depend on you as well, as well as our Board of Supervisors. Um, you do a great job of um, uh, your understanding and being involved in all of the bills that are coming to the General Assembly. And our legislators depend on you because they will ask, now what do you think about this, Mr. Malloy? So thank you very much. And we certainly hope that they will resolve the budget. And it would be wonderful if in fact the um, funding for all schools is raised if we will finally get back to the 2009 level. It'd be great for all of us. So, thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. you. We will stand uh, in wait to get the next report. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, our next agenda item 
is the strategic plan goal one, student success, and I call in Mr. Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the school board approve the strategic plan goal one, student success report as detailed in the agenda item. Second, second by Ms. Palchuk. Mr. Moon, you'd like to speak to it? Yes, just briefly, uh, Madam Chair. As we all know, in Fairfax County Public Schools, our business is about making a difference in the lives of Fairfax families, employees, and the community we serve. To ensure that every student receives the best possible education, preparing them for their best possible futures, the school system created a strategic plan that has four goal areas. And each year, the school board is updated on these goals. The first goal is a student success, where we commit to reaching, challenging, and preparing every student for success in school and life. The superintendent presented the goal one report at the school board meeting on April 12th. The report highlights successes as well as important challenges facing the school system, including continued gaps in opportunity, access, and achievement among student subgroups. The report format includes separate chapters for each of the four strategies under goal one. Each chapter includes a strategy introduction the related desired outcomes, student achievement data, and analysis to highlight the associated successes and challenges. The report's appendix includes additional details on the division student achievement results. The report provides the valuable information that the school board has asked for and needs to have to make the decisions in helping our students for their continuing success. The board discussed in great depth at the work session on April 16th. This is an excellent report, and I would like to ask for my colleague's support. And Ms. Palchak, would you like to speak to your second? Sure, also very uh, briefly, I think this report highlights um, some of what we do very well uh, here in Fairfax County, uh, which includes that we have gone in the past several years from having 18 to only three schools um, that are going that are uh, not fully credited sorry uh, and i believe we will have even less next year which is excellent uh, also uh, looking at our at our comparisons with uh, the international community we come in i believe sixth in reading compared to nations across the world and fifth in mathematics ahead of many nations including korea japan germany norway um, Finland and Switzerland and many of those tests. So there's so much that we do well. I think it also highlights where we still have great uh, areas uh, of improvement and we look forward to working with Dr. Bayran and Dr. Duran in addressing those from the achievement gap, the, the opportunity gap, um, and ensuring um, equity in implementation and in access to the best teachers and leaders and practices in all of our schools. So um, a lot to be proud of in our success so far and a lot that we hope uh, we can continue to improve moving forward. With that said, I hope, uh, I am happy to second your motion, Mr. Moon, and hope our colleagues will join us. Ms. McLaughlin. I know it's late, so I will just keep my comments even briefer than uh, my colleagues might expect. Uh, so basically, I, I want to echo my appreciation to Dr. Brabrand and staff. This is a, a report that I believe is even stronger than we've seen in years prior. Um, and I look forward to voting in support of it this, this year. Uh, but I do want to just reiterate some things that I shared at the work session and with staff that I would like to see us in support of staff continue to strive for more strategic meaningful measures. Uh, there are so many measures in there, and it's a lot of uh, time uh, taken for staff uh, to report on that, and so I think our work with you is essential for becoming more strategic in those metrics and measures. Um, I would like to see uh, deeper analysis um, using our me the meaningful metrics to really look at what does it tell us. Uh, the, and then being able to have um, the development of more strategic action going forward. You know, we've done the analysis, and then what does it tell us we need to be doing to close opportunity gaps, close achievement gaps, and uh, really uh, begin to uh, see uh, 
greater success in our one, sec one Fairfax commitment. And then uh, I do know that I appreciate that uh, we've had advocates from um, SEPTA, our special education advocates in the community. And uh, I would like to um, humbly ask that superintendent staff uh, really uh, work with them as we prepare the next year's report. Um, there was some concerns that were not as robust in the report doing that. And as I shared with them, they are the subject matter experts compared to my words. And, uh, but I certainly want to echo um, my commitment as a board member that however we can continue to do better in our analysis and needs for our special education students, um, I wanted to uh, make sure I put that on record here tonight. So uh, again, thank you to staff and especially Dr. Presidio who spent a considerable amount of time with Mr. Wilson and me uh, during our pre-meeting uh, manager discussions. Uh, you were most generous with your time and receptiveness to what we hope for this meaningful report. Um, thank you and again, thank you again, Dr. Braybrand, um, Dr. Presidio, Dr. Duran, our principals, our teachers, and all of the people who work very hard with our children every day. This was an extensive report. It's one of the most important uh, report outs that we see each year because it speaks to uh, how teaching and learning is going in our classrooms. This gave us uh, some very good news and, and it gives you ideas of what we need to do. There's always much more uh, on our plates to meet the needs of all of our children. So again, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody in our schools um, who work every day to do um, what is the best for all of our children. So with that, I call for a vote. All those in favor of approving the strategic plan goal one student success report. That motion is unanimous and passes. Thank you very much. Next is a consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. Item 6.01, approve the minutes of the April 12, 2018 regular school board meeting. 6.02, approve the 2018-2019 Annual Special Education Plan, Section 611, Part B, Grant Funding Application, and Section 619, Part B, Preschool Grant Funding Application, as detailed in the agenda item. 6.03, award a contract for the Bryant High School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, GTR Turf Inc., in the amount of $433,500, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.04, award the contract for the boiler replacement at Luther Jackson Middle School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Capital Bo Boiler Works, Inc., in the amount of 491,431, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.05, award a contract for the Mount Vernon Woods Elementary School renovation project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, RJ Crawley, Inc., in the amount of $16,750,000 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.06, .06, confirm the appointments and separations for the period beginning January 1, 2018 and ending March 31, 2018. 6.07, confirm the separations for the period beginning March 1, 2018 and ending March 31, 2018. 6.08, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Next is new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. 7.01, award the contract for the boiler replacement at Crestwood Elementary School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 
7.02, award the contract for the HVAC replacement at Lorton Center to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 7.03, adopt regulation 2601.32P, student rights and responsibilities as detailed in the agenda item. Superintendent Matters, Dr. Brabrand. Thank you, Chairman Strauss. I uh, wanted to bring a couple of things to your attention. We, we had a bill proposed by a team of uh, four Centerville High School seniors. will become Virginia law in July. The bill will make it mandatory for 911 call centers to accept text messages. Team members through Lee, Rodolfo Facini, Arco Mazunda, and Daniel Strach. Uh, students of Kathy Ruffing and Terry Ritchie proposed the bill as part of their AP government class and Virginia Senator George Barker of the 39th District introduced SB 418 to the Virginia General Assembly and the bill was signed by Governor Northam and will become law on July 1st. So that's a real portrait of a graduate opportunity to, to do and go out and solve problems in the community um, and we want our kids being responsible uh, citizens um, and so just a wonderful example of portrait of a graduate in action. We also have some news about the Blockheads, and this is a robotics team from uh, Lake Braddock and Thomas Jefferson, and they're headed to Detroit to compete against teams from 20 countries uh, around the world for the first championships. We actually just had first, we hosted it for the first time ever at Hayfield Secondary. I went out to see that, it's an amazing competition. The Blockheads won the state championship for the second year in a row, went on to win regionals and qualified for Worlds. They've earned three straight bids to Worlds for the robot performance. Team members are Roger Clanton, uh, David DeRochers, Paul Hahn, and Avery uh, uh, Nguyen from LBS, and Sam Bove and Antonto Zaman of TJ. They were named the Blockheads because their first robot was made of Legos. Finally, I just want to share with you uh, what I shared earlier today with Fairfax County Public School staff members. Um, it is with mixed emotions that I tell you that Deputy Superintendent Steve Lockard has officially been named the Superintendent of Schools for Carroll County, Maryland. This role is a lifelong pursuit of Dr. Lockard's, and he has strong personal and professional ties to that county. He, he grew up there. And his father, Brian Lockard, served with distinction as superintendent of the school district. I would like to thank Dr. Lockard for his incredible service to Fairfax County Public Schools over the past four years. His many accomplishments include establishing a new learning model for Fairfax County, overseeing the establishment of Project Momentum, and not least of all, leading Fairfax County Public Schools as interim superintendent and uh, a tremendous job, job he did in that role. I'd also like to thank Dr. Lockard personally for his personal support for me as I took on this role and for his steady hand and positivity um, in helping me during my time coming on this first year, but also as he led FCPS during a period of transition. Please join me now in wishing Dr. Lockard all the best. We will miss him and his outstanding leadership. I'd ask all to to please stand and uh, applause Dr. Lockhart for his work. And we warn you, Dr. Lockhart, we are going to formally honor you again before you leave. So we have to put up with us one more time because we are very, very grateful for the wonderful service you've provided to our children. Thank you. Um, now we have board reports and I call on Ms. Hines for a report of the audit committee. Thank you. The school board audit committee met last night and um, our agenda included um, updates on staffing in the Office of the Auditor General, a status of FY18 internal audit engagements, and internal inquiry updates. Um, we also had a report on the FY18 contracting and procurement oversight and process audit. 
Uh, we had oh, one, two, seven, seven or eight schools reported uh, business process turnover audits. Um, and our, we have decided that our next audit committee meeting actually will change from what is um, advertised. I believe we decided we would have the next audit committee on May 29th. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Thank you, board matters. And we will start with Ms. Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have several things uh, to mention tonight. Um, I very much enjoyed, as, as uh, always, Shine On Week at Stewart High School um, uh, in honor of Casey Shulman, who was uh, known for her her kindness and her positivity, and um, that remains a tradition at that school to honor her um, with um, uh, a, a week dedicated to um, uh, to those principles and values. And uh, want to report that the, in particular, the table with uh, uh, a book giveaway was absolutely jam-packed. And I, I do want to thank everybody who helped organize that um, uh, that event, uh, the whole event. It, w it was really, and we uh, got lucky with a wonderful day that day as well. Um, I also was uh, very pleased to attend uh, the performance of The Little Mermaid at Stewart, and uh, just wonderful, wonderful performances. And Saturday night, they were sold out. They were sold out uh, Saturday night, and uh, I think maybe that was a, a first, and it was a certainly certainly very welcome and, and well-deserved for the entire um, crew and, and cast of, of that great performance. So kudos to, to all, um, all those who uh, were a part of that. Um, I want to thank the uh, Belvedere Elementary School PTA for inviting me to attend the Safer Internet uh, assembly that they put together. It was a, a very well done presentation. The uh, the students uh, were were very well versed, and um, there was a, an, an interesting um, exchange of ideas between uh, the panelists and the students, who in in a couple of cases knew of areas that they needed to alert the adults to. So that was uh, that that was uh, certainly a, a great event, and I appreciate those that. Um, Put that together. Um, coming up, uh, I'm, I'm going to be pleased to attend the Hispanic Leadership Alliance dinner on May 8th at Gatehouse at uh, 6, uh, actually it starts a little earlier than that, 5.30 I think it is. Um, wonderful, wonderful uh, stories of students who are getting scholarships, very, very inspiring. I believe they still have tickets available if people uh, would, would like to attend and it, it really is a a wonderful and inspiring event. And then the, the next day, there's a free Latin American dinner uh, with art and poetry at Bailey's Elementary uh, Primary, Bailey's Primary. That one does start at 6.30. Um, I'd be happy to attend that as well. And um, I um, met recently, I just want to raise this issue with, with other board members. Uh, some of you have been, perhaps met with constituents on this issue as well. But I met with a, a constituent who um, wanted us to put more focus on in trying to get trauma-sensitive schools uh, to help our students who have experienced trauma. And uh, she is newly the liaison for uh, the Fairfax County uh, Council of PTAs on this issue. So um, I would be happy to work with any of my colleagues to, to bring um, this issue forward to, um, to be working on it. And last but certainly not least, happy um, Administrative Professionals Day to all of our administrative professionals throughout Fairfax County and especially those in the school board who do such a wonderful job for us. And a shout out especially to my amazing uh, EAA, Kathy Partlow. Thank you for all that you do, um, our administrative professionals. I'll pass. Ms. McLaughlin? Uh, yes. Um, I, uh, Dr. Brabrand, um, so I know we all have meeting and evening and long work day fatigue, but I just wanted to briefly bring to your attention along with my colleagues that um, I held community office hours earlier this week, and it was the night after we'd done FCPS on community meeting uh, over at Robinson 
uh, secondary school. And I, I do want to say that uh, the community complimented Dr. Presidio. They felt he did a wonderful job in terms of his kind, responsive engagement. Um, but the community did say that they have uh, very serious reservations about this. And uh, it, they uh, essentially were worried and said that by the time they left the meeting, they weren't quite sure what the purpose was. Was it truly to get community feedback about this concept or was it to um, simply enlist um, community support that this is a done deal, it's gonna happen, and we just wanna make sure that everybody has sort of a, a warm and fuzzy feel about it. And um, a, a big piece of concern that people have is uh, that this is a generation of kids who too many of them already have a smartphone attached to their palm of their hand like it's an appendage, and they need as much opportunity in school to engage with each other, to engage with their teacher. And uh, so I think uh, my takeaway from hearing um, from the community where it was brought up again another night when I was um, another community event is that we're gonna really need to have, I think, some more robust board conversation um, with your team to really understand what this is because uh, I, I heard more concern than excitement about what this was gonna mean. And I know how much you love and care about the system and our families and our kids, so I just wanted to kind of put that on your uh, radar. I also wanna say that um, I appreciate your responsiveness um, this week with the community reaching out to the board and then us reaching out to you about um, some of the communication around foreign language courses. And uh, Ms. Vanaconda, you were an eloquent speaker to it tonight and I appreciate that. Um, but I do think that's something else that we're gonna need to really kind of make sure the board has some clarity on because I, I, I know I, uh, it came as a surprise to me. Um, and then I do want to just uh, make everyone aware that Robinson tonight had uh, a presentation that included a discussion about vaping. And uh, I continue to hear some very frightening stories about e-cigarettes, um, the vaping um, that, that students do with those. And most recently it was on the news that uh, some of the, the vaping um, chemicals have rat poison in them and kids are, are um, becoming seriously injured. So this is a, a national conversation, but I, I appreciate that, um, Dr. Bray Brown, I'm seeing more and more of our schools trying to do more intentional work around that. Um, and I understand there's gonna be some things coming to us with the SRNR, but I'm going to make my plea as my colleagues are used to hearing me, intervention, prevention, education, um, severe punishment alone, is not going to curb this, and uh, I don't want us to miss the mark on how we effectively embrace this. And then um, the other thing I want to make people aware is something I is just coming to my attention. It may not be happening in other schools, but it's happening in one of mine, where students, um, particularly in the middle school, they're participating in an action called necking and thunderclapping. Necking is when you take the palm of your hand and you smash it as hard as you can on the back of someone's neck when they're unsuspecting and leave a handprint. And um, sadly, a young man in my district um, sustained a very serious concussion um, back in the fall and he's still experiencing the ramifications of it. Um, thunder clapping is when a student comes behind another student with both their hands and clap them super loud, hard on a student's ears. Um, Again, I think sometimes our students just think they're horsing around with each other, and I don't think they realize, especially in the younger grades, middle school, um, that this could have serious um, physical harm and impact on students. So um, I'll be talking more with my regional superintendent, um, who's already aware of it, and Dr. Brabram, but I just wanted to tell some of my colleagues, because when I mentioned it to a few others already, they would not heard of this, um, but it does worry me that, um, you know, we, we've got to look out for the safety and well-being of our kids. So um, thank you for your indulgences tonight, my colleagues. And um, I, I, I really do want to just say, as I shared the other night, it's such a joy to be able to do this work 
And I know our work is hard together sometimes, but I, I just want to express my appreciation to all of you for letting me, you know, be a part of this journey and the work we're doing together. Ms. Palchuk? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, congratulations, uh, formerly Dr. Lockhart. We will miss you. We're glad that just as Dr. Brabrand, you also get to return home um, and lead your system. Uh, and we will celebrate you soon. I also want to thank the clerk and all of our uh, administrative assistants and Kathy Partlow. Um, the, the past few weeks, I had uh, the chance to visit what really is one of the most heartwarming things for me is one of our community partners that does a lot of great work with our families. Um, the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia uh, has their offices based in the James Lee Community Center in Providence, um, and they gave me very generously two hours of their time uh, after work to, to tour uh, their work, what they do, um, and to share the partnerships uh, and their outreach in the community for our, our adults and our many of our parents. So I appreciate all the work they do um, and hope we can continue to partner with them as a county. Um, also had the chance to take my nieces and nephew to see Cinderella at Kilmer Middle School and celebrate my niece's 10th birthday. Uh, so thank you, Kilmer, for your kind hosting, and it was really an incredible um, experience doing excellent work from staging to music to the singing um, and costumes. I will be holding my uh, monthly office hours again at Panera this coming Saturday morning uh, in the Mosaic District down the street. We'll start a little bit earlier uh, because of other commitments, so it will be from 9 to 10.30 this Saturday um, here at Panera and Mosaic District. And also looking forward to two outdoor activities in May as we start to get outside. Uh, many of our schools do the MIWI, the Meaningful Watershed Education Experience, uh, and partner with our, um, the county's watershed program, stormwater program, uh, who also educate our kids. So Mantua, my alma mater, is hosting the community uh, on May 4th to see the work they're doing with birds there. And also on May 5th, I look forward to being at Nottoway Park for their invasive species management program. If anyone's looking for volunteer hours or want to get your kids outside, uh, it's always a fun experience and very relaxing when you're done pulling all of those species. So I uh, hope you enjoy the weather. I know I've been waiting for uh, spring to come and I'm very excited that it's here. And with the remaining, I believe, seven weeks of school, there is a lot to do to help de-stress and enjoy the outdoors. Thank you. Mr. McElveen. Pass. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Just a couple of quick things. Uh, I wanted to thank the Fort Belvoir community, the DFMWR, for their um, outreach to the Mount Vernon High School community, especially our special education um, students that are in transition through the STEP program. Uh, we have a wonderful new MOU with Fort Belvoir to create uh, work experiences for these kids. So uh, that program, that MOU was signed last Friday. Also want to um, give a heads up and encourage people to go out to the sixth grade all county chorus uh, concert on Saturday and on tomorrow to go to Saratoga and see the public safety day experience. Thanks. Mr. Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know that you, as a part of a CAPES program, will be watching many student performances. You bet, and watch for those how reviews. Many, Stewart's many, review should be coming up. How many are you watching? We have 60 shows. You got 60 shows. I don't think I can watch 60, but in the next couple of weeks, I'll be watching about six. So if uh, any of my enlarged colleagues want to join me, just let me know. Ms. Hines. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say to anyone, if you're still here or if you're watching, if you were here tonight for the forum meeting that we were supposed to have, and it was postponed, um, sorry that it was postponed. I, I, Mr. McElvain and I have an important issue on our forum agenda, and this is the second time that it's been postponed in as many meetings. So we have a hard time getting out of closed meeting and getting to our forums. So I'll be asking the chair if we could put a half hour forum on the agenda for, m next, uh, for May 1st. Um, we have, that's uh, I believe next, Next Tuesday, I'm sorry, we have a work session at five, we have a work session at six 
I'm, I want to ask the chair if we could possibly have a, work, a, a forum at 5.30 before the work session. Um, I, I will ask the superintendent and staff. I, I okay. see no reason, but I will need to make sure that our colleagues can get there. I mean, no reason not to. Okay, so. yeah. The other option okay. I was going to suggest was just at our next meeting, our next regular meeting, May 10th, if we could start the forum at 5 and then the closed meeting at 5.30. We will try to figure it out. Yes, Thank it you. is time to get to it, and I'm sorry. Thank you. Ms. Schultz? I want to acknowledge Benny, our upcoming student rep, who is getting his, get, you're getting your, your, your practice in, right, um, for the future. Um, I want to thank all of the community members who came out to the town halls that I had this week. Um, it's been, uh, again, um, the public engagement part is one of the best things that I do. Um, Dr. Brabrand, just so you know, some of the big hot button issues that came up at uh, the town halls. Um, I do have split feeder issues, as we are well aware, um, in the southern end of my district with Rolling Valley and my Rolling Valley families, but I also have a burgeoning issue, um, and it's an even smaller population, but I am gonna be coming forward to facilities and being asking for some data um, with respect to the families that live um, in the Greenbrier um, cashment um, who are very close to Rocky Run, but are dragged into Lanier and Fairfax. And so that's a heads up that that's coming down the pike. Um, there is a, a tremendous um, surprise that I've had um, that I didn't know was coming, and I think one of my other colleagues mentioned it with respect to sort of the evaporation of languages at the high school level. And this is um, rather sudden, um, and I know that you've responded to our, our email requests, and we're looking forward to that data, but just um, to let the public know that the degree of concern um, that they have, I share in what are winnowing choices at the high school level um, and the seeming replacement of romance languages um, and you know Latin and uh, French, uh, Japanese, um, and being substituted across the board for Spanish and then wiping out of sessions of American Sign Language. So I have a, a tremendous concern about that. The other thing that um, came up, and I think my colleague Ms. McLaughlin brought it up, is there is some very serious concern around um, what has been um, discussed with the community at the FCPS on. Um, there is a feeling that it's a fait accompli. Um, there's a feeling that the principals are, are squirreling away money um, now, and what does that do for the budget for next year? And um, really, what's, what's the practical spectrum of information as opposed to just a wholesale buy-in? Um, what else don't we know? And I think it's really important for uh, staff and the board to be asking those questions. I think it's appropriate. Um, I have provided some information from some very senior executives from Silicon Valley who've sort of left and created the Center for Humane Technology. And um, I look forward to potentially even inviting Max Stossel here to present to us the Paul Harvey rest of the story. For those old enough to know what the Paul Harvey rest of the story is, you get that. Um, certainly there are family life education um, concerns. Um, I felt that it was very interesting. One of the speakers tonight said, why not respect all of us and allow us um, some choices? Uh, we seem to respect choice and parents and requests on every part of the spectrum, except when it becomes um, associated with family life education. I think it's unnecessarily hostile, and um, there is a, a true sense that is being shoved down um, the throats of parents with with little option, and I think that's a bad tactic for us to take, and I think there's some reasonable um, uh, options being brought forward, and I think that we need to authentically engage that part of the community. And the last thing, um, certainly there are some questions around the transparency on the funding and the fundraising with respect to uh, Jeb Stewart, and we certainly look forward to um, that community getting support to raise whatever money it needs um, to, uh, to offset um, any of the costs associated with the fundraising so that we take that 
off the taxpayer um, uh, uh, back. And so I look forward to that being a robust fundraising experience um, and wholeheartedly support um, the incoming of private funds to uh, waiver that and um, answers to budget questions because I have serious concerns about dipping into a flexibility reserve and then how that flexibility reserve comes back up to um, its full, fully funded amount because it's going to have to come from someplace else. So those were largely the, the topics that came up at uh, my respective town halls. And again, I thank uh, the community for coming and expressing um, their concerns and their support for our school system at those um, meetings. Ms. Dana Koufax. Thank you. I have been busy the last few weeks. There's lots of invitations to all of us as we can all hear. We're all busy going places, so this is a great time of year. I attended the teen job fair at Mount Vernon High School. It was sponsored by members of the Board of Supervisors, Supervisor McKay, Supervisor Stork, and Supervisor Harity, and was coordinated um, by uh, the staff at Mount Vernon High School. And attendance was robust, and people were really excited to be there, so, be there, so it was a great event. Um, I spoke to the Edison High School PTSA with Dr. Braybrand. We gave them an update about the budget, where we are on our um, looking at facilities and looking at safety protocols, and what we'll be looking forward to with the June report. Uh, Dr. Braybrand did an excellent job answering their questions, and they were grateful for you being there and uh, you know sent us a, a kind letter for our, our attendance. Um, I was thrilled, um, as were many of my colleagues, to attend a lunch at the Davis Center. And the Davis Center is one of our two centers designed to serve students with disabilities aged 18 to 22. And these amazing students actually help prepare dinner for us prior to our meeting, which we have in the back on, Thurs on these Thursday night meetings. And it was lovely to meet and to share lunch with them in their classroom. And by the way, they are available for catering opportunities. <laughs> so you can look them up on our website, and it's the Davis Center. Um, Ms. Corbett Sanders said, and Mr. Malloy talked about the meeting that we had earlier this week. Um, with delegates Paul Krizak, Vivian Watson, Mark Sickles. Um, they are members of the Virginia House Select Committee on School Safety. Um, thanks to uh, Mr. Malloy, Mr. Plattenberg, um, Ms. Panarelli and Ms. Teresa Johnson for being there as well. If I miss, I, there, were, there were lots of people there for this meeting. And basically, they wanted to hear what FCPS is currently doing with respect to student safety, school security, and student mental health, and what our timeline was for continuous improvement. So hopefully, um, we made a commitment for us to stay in touch with them and them to tell us about their progress. Um, I also attend with some of my colleagues the Foundation for Applied Tech, Techn Technical Education or FATE Dinner um, for our wonderful teachers and our generous business partners. This is a great organization and um, I, I thank you for uh, hosting um, some school board members who were, who were there as well as you were honoring your teachers. Um, yesterday, Ms. McLaughlin, I guess she'll have a report next time on the skipped committee where um, we had a robust com conversation on community schools and the opioid uh, task force plan. And this weekend, like Mr. Moon said, I, uh, well, I think somebody, I'm going to attend the sixth grade all county choral festival at Hayfield, and I also plan to catch a musical or two, so I'm excited. Um, so thank you, and uh, have a good evening. Ms. Keys Kamara. Well, I wanted to also mention the Davis uh, event. I enjoyed the luncheon, and I understand that um, they make a mean carrot cake that contains walnuts. You can request it without the walnuts, and they're happy to sell that. I think I'll be one of the first people in line to purchase that one. Um, I also attended the Holland Meadows Elementary School PTA. I don't know with Ms. Court Karen Corbett Sanders was there as well, not at the same time. But they had a, a tech event um, sponsored by M Microsoft where they actually uh, got to put together these um, robotic hands. And at the end of the night, you could see the excitement of the children as they watched those hands. And I found that to be 
a really great event. I, I had a, enjoyed uh, attending with a number of my colleagues the um, special education conference, um, I, I, I think a couple of weekends ago. And I also had the occasion this past weekend to speak at the Zeta Phi Beta sorority dinner where they um, do, announced their scholarship recipients, all of whom were Fairfax County students. So um, it's been enjoyable and um, good night. Thank you. Um, I will share some events in the Drainsville District. I want to congratulate the Longfellow uh, uh, Science Olympiad team. They won at the state uh, first place and Thomas Jefferson won first place for the high school division for the Science Olympiad. Both both of these schools will be going to the national tournament in Colorado in May. And also state level winner, winners, Luther Jackson won second, Kilmer won third, and Cooper won fourth. Kudo, kudos for Fairfax County Public Schools. And at the high school level, Langley won third, and James Madison won fifth. So good job, teachers and students. Uh, I was able to attend the um, Cooper Middle School Quest uh, demonstration. All of the students had to participate uh, in various types of inquiry-based, project-based learning. The eighth graders was uh, emphasis on uh, creatively solving an existing problem in the student's community based on a service learning project. And the seventh graders, uh, their projects were called Curiosity Quest, and their projects were based on critical and creative thinking. And again, all of them project-based learning. It was amazing 3D um, uh, projects, very, very interesting, and the students had to present them, explain them. Every student in the school participated. I also was invited to be a part of a roundtable discussion uh, sponsored by the Aspen Institute Justice and Society program. It was at the Adams Center. Uh, it was on um, pluralism in peril, challenges to the American ideal. Um, the Aspen Institute and the release of this um, study, uh, they wish to offer guidance to community and interfaith leaders, youth serving organizations, philanthropists and state and local officials on specific action steps to build a more resilient, trust-based environment that fully incorporates American religious minorities. Um, the uh, board chairs of all the Northern Virginia public schools were there as well as a number of um, uh, uh, local government officials. It was very interesting, and uh, everyone's desire to create an accepting, resilient, and welcoming community, and I shared our one Fairfax policy um, with the Aspen Institute. They were very interested in that. Today, I also had an opportunity to attend a conference at the National Wildlife Federation Career Pathways for Sustainability, Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. And um, the purpose of that, and we also had staff there from our CTE department, the purpose is to identify sustainability drivers and occupations across Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. to illustrate the regional context of green CTE. It was fascinating to hear what's going on in Washington, D.C., including urban gardens. Uh, they also want to illustrate enhanced career pathways for sustainability by crosswalking related competencies in various CTE clusters with example supply chain to ground theoretical discussions in real world needs. It was fascinating. And look for uh, opportunities for uh, creating sustainable CTE career paths embedded with our own certifications and our own curriculum and stronger partnership with uh, community college and college level so that we create more um, uh, with better pathways that actually sustain um, the kinds of jobs and careers that uh, green technology and environmental issues um, will require. And uh, we shared curriculum including the National Wildlife Federation's Eco Schools for K-12, which is a huge program that we participate in. They also have a program for college level, but our career and technical education people were there. There was somebody there from COG because the regional governments are also looking at uh, finding ways to better train young people to be prepared to take the jobs that they say are there now 
and there is where there is a scarcity within um, uh, uh, employment opportunities that many of our kids and our parents don't know about, and we need to train our kids because that's where a lot of the jobs in the economy is going. So um, that was fascinating. So our CTE people promised they would come back and and uh, provide more opportunity and look for more certifications. So with that, we get to go back into closed session. The board will now make a motion to go into closed meeting to discuss and consider disciplinary matters concerning four students pursuant to section 2.2-37118A2 of the Code of Virginia. Is there a motion? Moved by Ms. Corbett Sanders, seconded by Ms. Schultz. All those in favor? No, I'm sorry, we have to finish our work. Thank you very much. That motion carries. The school board has to go back into close to finish our work. Thank you.